The Horror at the Edge of the Forest from Lost in the South. I want to share a memory that has haunted me since I was a kid. Paint a background of horror that if believed should surely give you pause when the moon begins to rise. This is the reason I won't go near any forest or even dimly lit areas when the sun begins to go down, when the last rays of beautiful bright light start to cast menacing shadows across the world. Don't get me wrong, there was a time when I loved running around at night. Playing tag or hide and seek at night as a kid are probably some of the best games I'd played, and moments that I shared with people that I've since lost touch with over the years. But then again, after that one summer night many years ago, we all kind of just stopped hanging out with one another outside of school. I grew up in a densely wooded area in the deep south, the kind that would have miles of nothing but huge trees packed tight on both sides of the road before you'd ever see a house. I lived in a small neighborhood of maybe 15 houses that made up about four streets off the main road. I didn't mind much because that meant I always had someone to play with we were the only kids for miles, and in the summer it seemed like there would always be some kids running through a backyard to get to someone else's house during the day, and when the sun would start to set, you may see those same kids rushing off to home trying to beat the streetlights coming on. Now, on one particularly cool July afternoon, just as the sun was beginning to set, I was sitting at the top of the steepest of the streets in our neighborhood looking at the little dirt road at the bottom. I was with my best friend, Danny, and we were waiting for the cars that we knew were down that dirt road to leave. You see, at the end of this dirt road, maybe 150 yards from the main road, there was a small group of workers. They were building two new homes, and seeing how Danny and me were wanting to build a new fort, we needed supplies. Now I know what you're thinking, no, we weren't going to steal their things. But we two kids figured there would be plenty of scrap wood and nails lying around. The spare stuff that was destined for the trash dumpster anyway. Stuff we figured no one would even know was gone. The problem was we had been sitting there for almost an hour already, and we hadn't seen anyone come down that road or turn to leave. Finally, after what felt like an eternity of sitting in the same spot, staring at the same dirt road that disappeared back behind the same stand of way too tall trees, I'd had enough. I stood up and told Danny to come on, because I figured, screw it, they must have already left before we even got there. By now, there really wasn't any light left in the sky, and I was mad at myself for waiting so long to start down the dirt road but I'd been sure that I saw the workers leaving at the same time, right before dark every day that week. Worst case, we jumped behind some trees on the side of the road if we saw headlights coming down. It took maybe five minutes to walk down that dirt road, but it was dark, and the light from the flashlight Danny had somehow thought to bring didn't really do much in the way of lighting up the road. If anything, it made the shadows on the sides of the road look way darker than they should. But we did come into the big clearing that had been cut out of the trees for the houses that were being built. When you first come into that clearing, the houses are sitting opposite of each other, maybe 40 yards between them. It appeared as if they would be building more houses there, beside those sometime later. But for now, I was more interested in the fact that the house that was almost finished had a light on inside and there was a truck parked beside the house. By then, Danny and I had already stopped. We were looking and listening for any sound of someone inside. Maybe they were working late, or packing up tools to carry home for the weekend, because some of those guys do have a lot of stuff to pack up when they're done. We didn't hear anyone, though. Nobody was walking around. No one was coming outside with tools in their hands. No one was loading things into the truck. Without really thinking about it much, we had already snuck right up to the house and were standing in front of the open doorless entryway with its makeshift steps that looked like they shouldn't have been able to support the weight of a full-grown man going up and down them. Either way, I slowly crept up the steps, just far enough to poke my head inside and look around. I could see all the way through most of the house, 
They hadn't put up the sheetrock yet in a lot of places. But I didn't see anyone inside. I jumped back down the steps and told Danny that the guy must have left his truck there. Rode home with someone else, I guess. Maybe he'd be back later, but right now we needed to hurry because our moms would already be mad that we took so long to get home from playing in the first place. We quickly started looking through the big pile of used wood that had been thrown out beside the house, hoping for some big pieces we could use for walls. After gathering up and testing the small load of scrap wood for weight to make sure it wasn't too heavy to carry, we went back inside the house to see if they had left any open boxes of nails lying around that wouldn't be missed. I found what I was looking for, but it wasn't a small box of nails. It was a big metal Folgers coffee can that looked like they had been pouring just any loose nails or screws that had been left over into it. I was wearing one of those short-sleeved shirts that still had a hood and front pocket on it, but would never really be warm enough in the winter to wear. So I grabbed a handful and shoved them into my front pocket of my shirt, starting back to the door when I heard Danny fall behind me. I turned around to see him lying in what appeared to be paint, paint that someone had forgotten to clean up after it was spilled. I laughed a little and gave him a hand up, and that's when we heard it. Someone was walking around outside, but it didn't really sound right. It sounded slow, almost like each step was thought out or deliberate, like whoever it was already knew we were inside and was purposefully walking around the back of the house like he wanted us to know he was there. We freaked out, taking off out of the front entryway, jumping down the steps, running off, leaving the small pile of wood we had collected, and dashing towards the small spot in the trees where the dirt road was leading back to safety, the safety of our neighborhood, and streetlights that would illuminate our way home. The problem was, whoever had been behind the house walking slowly around was now to the right of us, just far enough into the trees that I could only make out his shadow, but his shadow looked funny to me. As I ran full speed for the end of the road, I glanced to the right, looking for the shadow, but it was running off to the left of us now, and it was closer. Close enough, I could see that it wasn't a person. It was too tall to be a man. Plus, no man had ever had ears that stuck up and back a little, coming to a point just behind the head of what I swear to Christ I thought was a werewolf. The long snout, the eyes that seemed to just faintly glow a dull green. But still, the thing was in shadows, and I was running scared, thinking I was about to be killed so it wasn't like I could make out everything perfectly. That thing was big, though. My God, it was huge. My dad was six foot three, and this thing even slightly bent over running, and mostly covered in shadows, was way taller than my dad was. We were almost to the end when this thing was suddenly behind us. It happened so fast that it had just been beside us, but now, in the blink of an eye, it was just right there. So impossibly close, I thought it was going to grab me at any moment and rip me apart. Just then, I remembered why my shirt felt heavy and it was flopping up and down as I ran for my life. A big old bunch of nails. I had the nails in the front pocket of my almost hoodie shirt. I quickly reached in and pulled out what I could, dropping them behind me as we kept on running. I was sure this thing was so big that it probably wouldn't even feel it but I soon heard a yelping, snarling, pained kind of sound, followed by what I hoped was the creature falling. I could not believe my luck. It had stepped on those nails. Just then, Danny and I burst through the tree line, breathing heavily as we started running up the street. Maybe a little slower, but still we pushed on up the steep road to the top before we stopped underneath the bright glow of the street lights. As we looked down at the trees we had just run through, the trees that should have been the last place I ever breathed another breath of air into my lungs, we saw it, just standing outside the trees. We could see it good now, and it frightened me to the very core of my being. Never have I experienced such raw fear in my life as that one moment 
when I thought it was going to start running up that street after us because I knew that it had been playing with us before. I knew it was much faster, much stronger than it had been. I knew I had gotten lucky with those nails and that if this thing started to run after us then, it would be sure to catch us in a matter of seconds. It didn't though. It's like it just took one step back. Then the trees, or maybe the darkness itself, just swallowed it up again. But that was fine, and I was darn near in tears with relief as we turned and ran up my walkway to the front door of my house. We ran in, straight to my room, closing and locking my window as my mom shouted after us, asking where in the world we had been. We didn't say anything to my mom and dad about what had happened. I mean, come on, they're not going to believe that a couple of kids ran from a freaking werewolf anyway. We didn't sleep that night at all. We were way too scared. That thing was going to come out of the woods behind my house and get us. But as night wore on, the sun began to finally come up again. I got the courage to look outside the window. There seemed to be nothing there, or at least I thought there was nothing. As I scanned outside, the sun began to shine on the ground outside the window, and I could see prints in the soft earth. Huge paw prints. This thing, this beast, was at my window last night, standing there. It knew it was my window. I know this, because when I investigated outside after that, mine was the only one with paw prints under it. I freaked out and went inside, but I stopped in the living room. I could hear my parents hush whispers in the kitchen. I snuck a little closer to the doorway going into the kitchen so I could hear what they were saying. Apparently, my dad's friend, who was a cop, said they found a man's body that morning. After responding to his wife's frantic call about her husband never coming home from work that night, and how it was weird because in 27 years, the guy was always home before nine on Fridays. So when she called for the fifth time throughout the night, they finally went just after dawn and discovered that the guy's truck was still there. They had found blood inside the house, and I instantly knew that Danny hadn't slipped in paint. It was the man's blood. They did not find the man's body right away. Not all of it. They found his legs just at the edge of the trees behind the house, and his head wasn't too far from that. But the rest of him they found in a tree, about 50 yards from the house. This thing had carried him up the tree to eat him slowly, and I guess it decided to leave it there when it heard us snooping around the house. After that, our parents didn't really let us do much. The rest of the summer was pretty much spent indoors. But I was fine with that, because I knew it wasn't a mountain lion or a bear that killed that man and dragged his half-eaten torso 25 feet up a tree. It was a werewolf, and it knew where I lived. It had stood outside my window for God knows how long, but why didn't it kill me? Maybe this will help some of you feel a bit better knowing you're not alone in this. Like I said, you're not crazy. These creatures are real, and they're just outside, skulking around waiting for someone to slip up and come a little too close. There's something in with the cows, from username 38272. I was 13 at the time. My family and I lived in the country because we needed more privacy. We had a lot of cows, big cows. So my dad, my big brother, and I would do head counts on the cows regularly to keep track of them. Our family had 60 acres of land in Nevada, containing 37 cows. One day we were doing a head count. We counted 37. All of them were there. A couple of hours later, my dad caught the cows going crazy. He looked on the cameras and saw the cows going nuts, running as fast as they could from something. They ran all the way from the south pasture to the north one. The three of us did another head count there and there was only 36 now. I figured one of them was still down in the south pasture. I went looking for it. I found it lying down on its side. At first, I thought it had fallen asleep. I went to take a closer look. Then I saw that it wasn't breathing. 
My dad and my brother soon joined me. My dad wrapped his head around the situation and told my brother to get the truck. We had a cow to bury. Later on at two in the morning, I heard a loud noise coming from the woods. I decided to go check it out. I grabbed a flashlight and went out. When I got there, there was a huge hole where we had buried the cow. A trail of blood was leading out of it, going deep into the woods. I followed it, thinking that some stupid bear or something dug it up and wanted to eat it. Quietly, I followed the blood trail. I stumbled upon what appeared to be a deer. Upon closer inspection, it wasn't some deer. It was this thing that had no fur, and it had weird-looking arms, and it was terrifyingly tall. It was eating the cow we had just buried. I ran as fast as I could back to the house, waking up my mom and dad, telling them what happened. They didn't believe me. They said I probably had a bad dream. I protested, but my dad said he didn't want to hear any more of it and told me to go back to bed. I went back to bed as he said, but my dreams were filled with visions of the thing I saw in the woods, eating that cow. In the morning, I went to check on the cows. Once again, they were running around as if something was chasing them. I couldn't help but assume what was doing the chasing. I ran to my mom and dad again. By the time we got to the cows, another one was missing. We scanned the fence and the property, and all we found was a hole in the fence large enough for a cow or a similarly large creature. My dad said the cow escaped, but I know exactly what got a hold of it. Ever since then, I fought tooth and nail to have less and less to do with the cows because I was so afraid that that antlered creature might just take me instead. When I turned 26, I moved to Las Vegas, putting an end to my scary experiences. Beast in Northwestern Florida from Scared Monkey 99. I recently went to a ranch in the middle of nowhere to go horseback riding. Now, this place is absolutely huge and surrounded by forest, and me, being a believer in the supernatural, chose to go on a two hour sunset ride, hoping to see something. The sun was still up when I pulled up to the ranch in my red Dodge Dakota. I was greeted by three or four different dogs. The ranch is also a dog shelter. I walked around to the back of the house and was greeted by another dog and my two trail guides. We talked for a moment and I signed some papers and I was soon saddled up on a large mare by the name of Saffron. I was then shown the basics of movement after that, I waited for my trail guides to mount their horses, and we were on our way with one of the dogs trailing behind us. The first hour went by quickly and uneventfully, with us trekking through the woods, stopping every once in a while to drink some water and give the horses a snack. It started getting dark about an hour 15 minutes into the ride, and that's when the noises started. They were hardly audible or noticeable at first, just a random faint sound of a twig snapping from the pressure of being stepped on, the crunching of fallen leaves being walked over, and the rustle of underbrush here and there. Just noises you hear in the woods on a normal basis. But soon enough, all other noises went quiet, as though all the small creatures were afraid to make noise for fear of being killed. The horses also started to get spooked at this time and needed constant reassurance. The sun had just dipped below the horizon, and there wasn't long left on the ride. So we started on our way back to the ranch with a small amount of light still coming from the sky. It was a good 30 minutes by walking. Everything was still, and the trail guides were spooked. There was fear in the air, I could feel it. It was easy to tell. The sound of rustling and branches snapping was louder than before, closer than before we started to pick up the pace. At some point, about 20 minutes away from the ranch, I looked behind me to ask the rear trail guide a question. When I saw something large and dark streaking across the trail where we had been moments before and my heart jumped, the trail guide saw my expression and turned around to see 
nothing there. They looked at me and asked why I looked so scared, and I told them with all honesty, Oh, probably just, uh, one of the dogs, they said with a hint of uneasiness in their voice. From then on, I kept glancing around and searching for the black mass I'd seen. Not two minutes later, I turned around again, and my face went pale. The trail guide saw my face once more and looked back with me. They proceeded to scream. About a hundred feet behind us, a large black figure stood on hind legs in the middle of the trail, with a deer in one of its massive claws. It wasn't a bear, not with the way its claws were wrapped around the deer's neck like that, and it stood nearly as tall as me on the back of the horse. I'm six foot five, and the horse I was on came up to my shoulders while standing. The creature's head was long with an open maw, dripping with blood or saliva. Its arms were unusually long, too, and its knees bent backwards, like a dog's. It was covered head to massive paw in sleek, pitch-black fur. The trail guide screamed, spooking the horses into a mad dash for the ranch, with their riders holding on for dear life, unable to look behind us. We got back to the ranch in record time, quickly dismounting and ran for the house. Once inside, the trail guide who had been in front asked what happened. The other trail guide and I looked at each other and decided it was the best not to tell the truth. We told them we had seen a large bear and it scared us and the horses. The trail guide who saw it walked me out of my truck, rifle in hand. I got in and floored it out of there. On the drive out of the country, I felt as if I was being followed. I felt eyes on me until I finally got inside city limits, and even then, I didn't feel safe until I was home. Let's just say I won't be going back to that ranch anytime soon. Blue Creek Skinwalker from Chris M. This happened to me back in 2002 when I was 7 or 8 years old. I lived in Ulaga, Oklahoma at the time, and my dad took me to Blue Creek to go fishing. Well, it was more so an off-the-beaten-path hunting trail connected to Blue Creek, which was part of Ulaga Lake. Anyway, I fished at a small stone bridge near the entrance to the area, while he went further up the creek. I was perfectly happy to be alone catching perch and one small catfish. As the sun started setting, that's when things got unsettling. I was still fishing and minding my own business when I heard what sounded like a mixture of wine and laughter off in the distance. I thought nothing of it. People came out there all the time for hunting and fishing. A few minutes passed and I heard it again, but it sounded closer. It sounded exactly the same too. I wasn't scared yet, and I'd chalk that up to me being too young to recognize something was wrong. Then I heard it a third time and it was even closer with the exact same tone as before, like it was a recording. At this point, I was spooked and began looking around. I heard it once more, along with a rustling sound in the nearby brush. I panicked then and ran up the creek bank where my dad was. I told him what happened and we left soon after. We never went back there. I had more or less brushed it off as a strange animal, but then I started listening to a lot of stories on here and some of them made me think of back then. I decided to ask my dad about it, and what he told me disturbed me. He said he had heard it too that day, but only for a little while, and he had hoped it was just an animal. When I came running up to him and told him what happened, he didn't mention what he heard to avoid scaring me. Whatever it was probably saw me as an easier target. Needless to say, I have no intention of returning to that place. Something huge and dangerous lives in our small lake. From SEB32 I live in southern Florida, and in my neighborhood we have a variety of lakes. There are large lakes connected to other lakes, and some that are just one small canal, which don't connect into any other waterway. I've lived in my neighborhood, which I enjoy fishing in, and I have for my whole life. 
you're probably wondering that I shouldn't be fishing too much in those lakes. It is southern Florida and can be dangerous. Now, before going fishing, I would often go to Bass Pro, a place where you can get any type of bait and tackle for fishing. Just before the whole isolation things went down, I'd recently gone there to pick up some fresh chicken livers for catfish fishing. The catfish we usually have are Placos, Bullhead Catfish, and Channel Catfish. The biggest ones we have in the lakes are the Channel Catfish, who can be about 3 feet long and 70 pounds. There soon came a day that changed my opinions on these lakes, and it happened only about a month ago as of writing this. Now, for me, fishing was pretty much the only thing I could do while being isolated. I'd been fishing for about an hour in the separate lakes, which connected into others, and at one point, I decided to try my luck in the small lake that didn't connect to any other. I had no luck in the others, so I went over there. This lake was probably 150 feet across and about 30 feet wide, so you can get the idea of how small it is. It was gradually getting darker then. It was around 5 o'clock, I think. I cast my line into the water a good 20 feet away, waiting for it to sink to the bottom. Catfish are bottom feeders, after all. After waiting about five minutes and playing around on my phone, I felt a sharp tug. I waited, then set the hook. Within a few seconds, I saw a small bullhead catfish about a foot long squirming around in the water. As I was getting the fish to the bank, something I didn't see tugged on my line, but with such a powerful strike that the rod nearly broke in two and that rod could handle a hundred pounds. My line snapped, and I fell backwards hard. The catfish was gone, and so was the rest of my line. What could have done that? A catfish so huge. I'd seen big catfish in the lake, but not one that could break my line that easily. As I mentioned before, you had to beware of certain dangers in the lakes around here, which included alligators, but in these parts, all the alligators were removed or exterminated. Unless the people had missed some, which I doubted, because when all of them had been removed, the people had captured about 50 of them, and that's a lot of gators. Snakehead fish, an invasive species that had been eating the fish in our lakes for a few years, couldn't have been responsible either. My line was graded and could withstand teeth, and no snakehead can outmuscle 100 pounds of breaking strength. I had no hooks on me, and besides, it was getting dark. I decided to wrap it up and go home. I could use some chicken liver for tomorrow. I'd get up early and get out again. I wondered, though, what could that thing have been? As I got up the next morning at around 8, I got ready to go again. I'd start at the same lake where I'd nearly caught the other catfish. I positioned myself a good distance away from the bank, thinking that indeed it may have been an alligator, so it would be a good idea to stay away from the edge. As I cast my line, I happened to look to my left, and to my surprise, I saw a dead bullseye snakehead, that invasive fish I mentioned. It had been cut in half. I didn't know what kind of predator could have done that to a snakehead, and the idea of an alligator filled my thoughts again. As I left my line for one moment, I headed over to the dead fish. It was clearly split in half, innards splayed. I could see the visible teeth marks on it too, and these were huge teeth. Even if it was a gator, it wouldn't have left the fish here, and would have eaten it within moments. Suddenly, my neighbor, Mr. Tom, stepped up to me. Hey, son, I saw that fish last night. It just washed up on the bank, and along came the rest of it a couple seconds later. I asked, Do you think it could have been a gator? Mr. Tom shook his head. No alligator would have done that. I haven't seen one since they took them all out. Besides, they would have come up and sunned themselves after all, and I ain't seen none of that. Must be another type of fish. 
It was true. An alligator or crocodile would have to come up and sun themselves every once in a while. Something strange was going on in this lake. I thanked Mr. Tom and he went back into his house. I continued fishing for a while. And then I felt another hard tug. I reeled in a smaller blue catfish after about a minute. To my shock, as I was taking the hook out of its mouth, I happened to glance over at the water, and what I saw made me jump back. I could make out a shadow about five feet from the bank, just sitting there. Yeah, there are plants and tall weeds in the water, but these were not weeds. No weeds could have been this shape. Plus, the water is clean. It couldn't be a pile of litter, and this shadow was big. I swear on my life, the front of it looked like an oval with a flat head. The shadow had to have been at least 25 feet, and this lake could get 40 feet deep. You can call me crazy, but I'm not kidding. This thing seemed to have fins on the side, like a shark, but these fins were bigger and wider than a shark. I couldn't see much else. I desperately tried to look for a tail of some kind. Then I saw it slowly seem to sink. When the last of the shadow was gone, I looked at the catfish. It was nearly dead, feebly flopping around. I realized I'd been staring at the shadow for a while. I quickly threw the fish back in the water. I quickly packed up my stuff and prepared to leave, thinking I probably would never come back to this lake. That's when I heard a splash. I whipped my head around and saw a giant head. It was a sort of grayish color. It was clamping the catfish I had just thrown back in its jaws. And these jaws were full of razor sharp teeth, at least four inches in length. Suddenly, the head dipped back into the water, along with it, the catfish. I was in disbelief, horrified of what I had just seen. The head was definitely not a shark or alligators, and when I researched this thing later to see what it could have been, the only thing similar to what I saw was the Dunkleosteus, a prehistoric sea creature. I couldn't see the tail of the thing in the lake, so I couldn't match its tail or body with this prehistoric monster. The teeth were a bit different, not bony and looking like a guillotine, like the teeth of a Dunkleosteus. The creature I saw in the lake had razor-sharp teeth in about two rows. The creature was also about 20 to 25 feet long, and a Dunkleosteus was said to be about 30 feet. So, I don't know what the heck I saw, but I've since stopped fishing in that lake. My questions are, could it have been a Dunkleosteus? But how could it be something that supposedly went extinct for millions of years? And what the heck is it doing in a freshwater lake that's not even as big as a regular-sized canal? Could there be a passageway? And how can it not have been seen by anyone else but me? There are so many answers I'd like to know. I don't even know what something like that would do to me if it got a hold of me, especially being able to rip apart a catfish like that. Just in case, when I fish in the other lakes, I stay away from the bank, and I never put as much as a finger in the water to release fish. I just throw them back, a good distance away from the edge. I'm not making this up. Again, you can call me crazy, Think of this story or me what you will, but all I'm saying is, there's something in the smallest lake in my neighborhood lurking beneath the shallows, and I don't think it's a gator or a crocodile. Don't go to Elk Island National Park from Drift. I live around the Edmonton, Canada area. This took place two years ago. I was 17 years old at the time, and I had become curious about alleged skinwalkers in the Elk Island National Park area. Knowing the people in my school who talked about it, I knew this could probably just be a rumor from some drunk teenagers thinking a deer was a skinwalker at night. Either way, me and my friends wanted to see if the legends were true. To this day, 
I don't know why I let myself get peer pressured into this after my friends called me a chicken. Keep in mind, I was 17 at the time, and somehow being called a chicken got me to go on the most regretful trip of my life. So we decided before class started that me, and for this story we'll call him Tom, would sneak through a hole in the gate. I walked past this area. While the hole was very small, it was big enough to get in. We were going to sneak in our friends who were 19 and had their permits to camp at the local Canadian National Parks. They agreed to help us get in. Now, at this camping trip, my two friends that were going to help us get in already found a good area where they wanted to set up camp for the night. It was about two and a half miles into dense woods. This was followed by a nearly invisible path that curved to the right. Believe it or not, it was even more dense than the main road that could barely fit an average car. The only thing telling us it was an actual road was a sign that said, Deer Ahead. The whole idea sounded sketchy to me. At the rate we were going, we would get to our spot in less than half an hour. They were speeding through the woods in one of the most bumpy roads I've ever been on. Unsurprisingly, the car soon broke down, right as we got to the side path. This meant we had to walk the rest of the way. One of the friends tried to pull up his GPS on his phone, so we would know where we were going. But his phone didn't turn on. I asked, Do you know where we're going? And he seemed not to hear me, or he ignored me, because he whispered to himself, I swear I charged my phone before I left. We all stopped to look around us. We could feel we were being watched. Then suddenly, we heard footsteps around us. The sound of dry sticks being cracked in the silent forest made me afraid for my life. We also couldn't see the thing that was doing this. But then, it all stopped. It seemed like we all thought the same thing, because at the same time, we all ran back to the car. As we were running... I could hear the sound of something running behind us. Then I heard Tom's voice. Help! Soon I heard the voice again in the far distance. Stop! It faded really fast and was coming from deeper into the woods. A sudden surge of courage came over me. I turned around to where I heard the voice of my friend. While running, I heard nothing for a while. Then I took a break on a log. But then I heard Tom's voice calling for help again, and it wasn't far from me now. I ran over to the voice. I was soon greeted by a large clearing which was illuminated by moonlight. I heard Tom again saying stop, but this time it sounded gurgly, but it also sounded distorted. I looked all around me, but I still didn't see anything. I knew at this point whatever was trying to get my attention probably wasn't actually Tom. Then right behind me I heard, Do you know where we're going? It sounded more like me this time. Then it said again, Do you know where we're going? This time it was more deep and distorted. Somehow I managed to get the courage to turn around, and I saw the most horrific thing I've ever seen. There was a creature there on all fours that had a normal right arm but slightly bent, but the left arm was completely bent the opposite direction that an arm is meant to. Its left leg was missing a foot, but the right leg had a stump with a weird wolf-looking paw. Its glowing yellow eyes looked into mine, then it stood up. I'm six foot one, and this thing was overlapping me by about two feet. That's when I saw the dark red substance dripping from its jaw. While we stared at each other, it opened its mouth and said, Help! Its mouth moved like a puppet, unnaturally. Its voice was much too deep to be Tom's. I was frozen, but it said one more thing that gives me goosebumps even still. Leave now. 
I swear it carried the sound of the W and now for an entire minute. I said nothing, then ran off back towards the direction of the road. When I found the road, I saw that the car was gone. They must have gotten in it without me, gotten it working somehow. This left me having to walk the most horrific walk in my life, but by then all the sounds came back, the crickets, frogs, all making their usual sounds. This gave me comfort. What I saw in that forest, I cannot explain, and the terror I felt cannot be described. After that day, I would love to say that I moved on, but the memory of that thing will never leave me. Just remember, if you're going to camp or visit Elk Island National Park, you've already made a big mistake. Possible Alien Encounter from Mr. Anonymous I don't know what happened, and I don't want to assume anything, but here we go. A couple of weeks ago, my girlfriend and I were camping in our backyard, like we've done numerous times before. We were drinking some wine by the campfire and making s'mores. We decided to retire into the tent around 2 a.m. I had managed to set up a TV and PS4 so that we could entertain ourselves before going to sleep. We cuddled, and she fell asleep around 2.30 a.m., and I fell asleep shortly after. I woke up around 4.30. I needed to use the bathroom pretty bad. I didn't want to wake my girlfriend up, though, as the zipper to the tent was kind of loud. So I used a bottle to the right of me. I turned to go back to sleep when I noticed that my girlfriend was gone. I'm startled and immediately worried. I call out her name, but I don't get a response. I threw on my shoes and grabbed the flashlight, fast as I could, then ran out of the tent looking for her. She has walked in her sleep before in the past, though not since we've been together, which has been two and a half years, so this was odd and sudden. I couldn't find her in the pitch blackness of the yard, so I ran to the downstairs sliding glass door and began to yell her name. Finally, I hear her voice from upstairs. She's yelling for me, asking if everything is okay, as my voice sounded really shaky. I asked her why she just up and left me in the tent like that, but she said, I didn't. I have no idea how the heck I got inside, let alone on the futon upstairs. I called a bullcrap, because if you sleepwalk, you don't close the tent zipper back up and close all the doors behind you. We went to go look for her phone because she had no recollection of even going inside the tent, even though she had only had a half bottle of wine. We aren't lightweights in the least. It usually takes a bottle and a half each for us to get drunk. I searched around. We managed to find her shoes, phone, and glasses inside the tent. I don't know what happened, but I know that's not sleepwalking. I've seen people do that before, and she's done it in the past. It's nothing like she's been through before. I also want to point out that I'm a very light sleeper. I would wake up to the slightest noise. Quite annoying, actually. So I would have heard her get out of the tent, especially the rustling of the sleeping bags. Yet her side was made perfectly. Like instead of getting out of the sleeping bag, she had simply vanished into thin air and reappeared in the house. Also, one last thing. My girlfriend reminded me about that night, that it was the only night we had slept without our dog or cat in the tent with us. So if something had wanted to take her out of the tent, perhaps it was feeling a bit more brave. But who knows? Thanks for listening, and I'd like to hear what you think may have happened. Goatman in Jamaica From... My Instagram is jossay underscore fa. I was 14 years old. It was Saturday, and we were going camping in one of the more rural parts of Jamaica. I won't name the place for privacy reasons, 
Now, I'm 5'3 and have a medium frame build, and we were going from where we lived to about an hour and a half worth of driving away. I'll read the rest of this in present tense at the request of the author. When we get there, we get our stuff from the truck and begin hiking to find a good spot. We come across a nice, calm, crisp-looking stream, so we decide to get some dinner right away. About two hours later, we pack up and start moving again. By now, it's about 4.30 p.m., and we find a good enough spot to set up camp. All of a sudden, though, we pick up this awful, pungent smell. It honestly smelled like expired sour cream and rotten eggs mixed in a toilet that hadn't been cleaned for years, then left in the sun. And it was close. I feel chills go down my spine and a wave of dread rush over me when I hear the shrillest, most ear-piercing screech I'd ever heard in my life. I grab the sawed-off double-barrel shotgun and run inside the tent, but I manage to fall asleep soon, despite it only being 6 p.m. At about 2 a.m., I awake to the sound of a branch snapping, and to make matters worse, I had to use the bathroom. Now, I'm a horror movie enthusiast. I knew all too well what not to do in situations like this. So I lie still with the double barrel still in my hand, ready to fire if I have to. Fast forward about 10 minutes later, when I hear my uncle scream, I quickly wake my dad, who is sleeping next to me, and slowly walk out, thinking he's just playing a trick on us, or hoping, I guess. But nothing could ever prepare me for what I see. This thing was at least eight feet tall, and it exuded the same smell I described earlier. It has two horns sticking out of its head, and it stands on two awfully man-like legs. I was assuming I was in heck, looking at the devil himself. Within no more than two awfully long seconds, I fire at the thing's leg. It jolts back in a way that is human-like, a little too human. Then it happens. This creature turns around and acknowledges us, almost as if it wants to speak. And by God, I swear it does. I don't exactly remember what it said, but it speaks in a deep, raspy, manly voice. I remember it having hellish red gleaming eyes that stared through my soul. I fire again, this time into its back, which seemed to be covered with white, dirty, disgusting-looking fur. After five seconds or so, the creature runs off into the woods, leaving a trail of what appeared to be blood. I look over at my uncle. He's almost in tears. As for my dad, he's just frozen. I don't know how I'm not as well. We all stay in one tent, packing things up, planning to book it back to the truck as soon as the sun comes up. After about seven hours, the sun finally comes up, and we all do as planned. When we get to the truck, we start it and drive out of there like a bat out of hag. On the ride home, we don't say a word, not until we get home. You'd think the story ends there, right? Well, not all fairy tales have happy endings, I'll tell you that. About two weeks later, we go down to the countryside to look for my aunt, uncle, and cousins. The drive was about three hours away from where we lived, so we go to spend the night with them. When we get there, we see them all standing on the front patio, waiting for us with a look of joy on their faces. Now, this place was about five acres of empty woodland area, but it had great lighting around the house from the LED solar-powered lights. Anyway, after about ten minutes of talking and catching up, we all go inside and make our way to the bathrooms to freshen up. When I'm finished, I get out and make my way to the room I'm staying in. Two of my cousins, Brian and Mario, out of the six, are in the room playing Forza Horizon 4 on the PS4. When it's about 10 p.m., I decide I'm going to bed. I say my goodnights and go up to the room. It's dark, and I don't bother to turn on the light. I just go straight over to the bed and tuck myself in. 
I hear the door open at one point, but brush it off as my cousin's coming in. About two hours later, Mario comes in, turns on the light, and screams. I'll never forget the look on his face when I ask, What's wrong? He looks as if he had just killed someone, accidentally. He's in total awe, because the thing that had been in the room with me was not my cousin. It was the thing we'd seen before, and we both are now watching it walk to the open window, descend, and walk away into the woods as if nothing happened. It moved so human-like, so disgusting, so purposefully. Everyone runs upstairs and asks what happened. We finish telling them the story, and Brian simply says, Goat Man. Fortunately, this was the last time I personally had an experience with this creature, and I hope it remains to be the last time. But sometimes I wonder, what would have happened if I had turned on the light, or if Mario didn't come in when he did, or if he had laid down next to this thing without bothering to turn on the light himself? I'm glad I don't know. It screamed from the Night Runner. I live in Minnesota, but I went to Wisconsin for a Boy Scout camping trip. We were going to Tomahawk, which is what the Boy Scout troop camp is called. I thought it'd be fun, but that feeling was about to change, when on the third day, I was going to the store just for a souvenir. I bought a hatchet. As I was on my way back, I looked for my friend Thomas, but he wasn't around. After giving up on looking, I went ahead back to camp. Mind you, by then, it was dark out, and I had no source of light, just some people in the distance. I cursed in my head about my friend just leaving me there, wondering why he did. After about five minutes of walking, I hear this faint scream. It was distant, but it was just eerie enough that I wanted to start running but then the scream got louder, closer. Even though I thought I would be at camp by now, it scared me out of my skin. Then came a growl right behind me. Without thinking, I looked behind me. I saw something. It was paler than gray, kind of a whitish tint. Its face ugh, still gives me night terrors just thinking about it. I heard it crashing through the forest, Eventually, and thank God, I made it back to camp after running away from it. In my panic, though, I did end up tripping over a root. I fell, causing myself to bleed. My scoutmaster came and helped me up, and my friend ended up getting in trouble for leaving me. But, end of story, I still don't know what the thing was, and I still have no idea how it was capable of traveling a few hundred yards in a few seconds because I know the scream wasn't that close, and then suddenly, it was growling next to me. If you have any clue, let me know. Skinwalker in Shreve, Ohio, from Pat. It was 2009. Me and my best friend B were camping in the backyard in rural Shreve, Ohio. I grew up on a couple of acres of land surrounded by roughly 1,500 acres of farmland. As we were camping and YouTubing skateboard videos, we began to hear coyotes off in the woods to our left. This is really common where I'm from, and generally they don't bother us. The coyotes were yelling and being loud, but then they just stopped making any noise at all. This was the first thing that really had us on edge. Then, out of nowhere, we hear a different noise. The sound of a large dog sniffing right outside our tent. We were pretty freaked out, as this was the closest a coyote had ever been to us. But then, a large human-like hand lays itself on the tent door where we could see it. We were just silent, too afraid to do anything. We sit there, wondering what on earth we could do. Out of nowhere, 
something huge begins to crawl underneath the tent. I'm not sure why it was so desperate to get under it. The whole time, it was growling viciously too. My friend grabbed the hammer we used for the tent stakes, and all at once, he starts to hit the thing where he felt the head was, instead of a yelp like any dog would. This creature growled even worse. It sounded demonic. After hitting it a few more times, we ran as fast as we could through the tent door and across an acre yard through the door to my garage. Every time I glanced behind us, I saw this massive shadow following close behind. Maybe I didn't look long enough at it when I glanced, as I didn't make anything out more than a black silhouette. Then again, it was dark and in the middle of nowhere. We get inside, and that's really where the tale ends. I remember being terribly scared for the whole night, and I never trusted those woods again. Sure, I'm not entirely certain it was a skinwalker, but that's what comes to mind, as it sounded like and behaved like a large dog, but its hand was definitely shaped like a person's, but I know it wasn't human. Werewolf Sighting From the Mad Miller in spring of last year, there have been reports from sheep farmers along the Dutch-German border, especially in the eastern Dutch provinces and way down in the southeast of the country. These shepherds have reported several cases of their sheep, and on some occasions even their sheepdogs, being slaughtered, but not eaten. These cases have been on the news several times, for if the killers would have been wolves like many suspected... They were displaying some off behavior. Namely, wolves don't just kill their prey and leave it behind. Nor would they consider fighting one or several sheepdogs on a normal occasion. And lastly, they would never invade human territory, especially not on their own. Not to mention the territory was being guarded by dogs and electric fences in the meadows. Still, there have been reportings of sheep and sheepdogs being killed and sometimes being partially eaten. In the southeast, there were 11 sheep, six of which were lambs, slaughtered, but left untouched beyond that. There was no trace found of the killer, save for the deep tooth marks in the torn throats of the dead sheep, as well as one paw print with a length of about seven inches. After those killings, there was a period of silence, until there came new reports of the killings in the East, having been done by wolves. This was said to have been confirmed by DNA tests coming from the bite marks on the dead sheep. Roughly a year later, there is now a small pack of wolves living on the biggest Dutch national park, Belua, and there have been no more reports of sheep being killed. Not in the news, anyway. The killer of the 11 sheep in the southeast has also been confirmed to have been a wolf, but this was never supported by DNA results or further arguments other than young wolves that are looking for a territory to kill sheep on farms to show other wolves who's boss. But this contradicts the statement that wolves wouldn't dare to approach human settlements guarded by dogs and an electric fence. It was all quite suspicious. I loved going into the woods at nightfall, so much so that I've done it at least three times this year, though visiting a forest after sunset or before dawn is still illegal here. I would often take a short walk right before sunset and leave when it was almost completely dark, wearing dark clothes, so the foresters or creepy people would not spot me easily. I don't know why I'm addicted to hikes, especially nocturnal hikes in the woods. I felt a really strong call of the wild, if you'd call it that, ever since the first time I went off trail in the summer of 2017. When I go out to visit the woods, either going off trail or not, not even the time of day matters. I'm always energetic and excited about it. I would even dare to say that I wanted to go hunting on some occasions. I would feel the urge to hunt when I'd see a deer or rabbit run by but I have neither a license nor weapons, so I'm pretty sure I wouldn't be able to do any of that. 
A few weeks ago, as of writing this, at the start of autumn, I went for another night hike in the forest. I had to bring my flashlight since it was cloudy and rainy outside. As always, I went there on my mountain bike, chaining it to a pole before I'd set off into the darkness between the trees. I saw the last people walking back to their cars and homes as I walked into the opposite direction. It had become completely dark when I made it to the middle of the forest. I silently enjoyed the cold, the scents and sounds of the woods, and I had nearly forgotten about my encounter in these same woods almost two years ago. After having set myself down on a wooden bench nearby, I heard the faint bleeding of sheep from about 200 meters away from me. I stood up and began to walk in the direction of the noise, mostly because the bleeding sounded rather distressed, as if the sheep were panicking and trying to flee from something. I was already surprised that I could hear it from that far away anyway, but what surprised me at least just as much was that I could smell the scent of the sheep as well. The wind was blowing in my direction, but still, I didn't know I was capable of this. I should mention it's quite normal to encounter a flock of sheep here in these woods, as local shepherds have their sheep stay in several places to control the weeds growing there. One day you might find them on the moor, and the other day you'd find them stationed near the bank of a lake. A low, fairly easily removable makeshift electric fence would hold the sheep from wandering off and losing the flock. Tonight, the flock had been placed on a small moor, about 200 meters from where I sat on a bench. It took me some time walking toward the pen before I could see the sheep, as the flock was hidden by bushes from my direction. Though what I saw when I arrived at the pen kind of shocked me, because not only were the animals running around frantically, trying to escape, but there were two slaughtered sheep lying in a small puddle of blood. I could see that their throats had been torn open by jaws that seemed bigger than those of a dog or even a wolf. There were no signs of the fence having been touched, though. What I did notice were a scramble of enormous canine-looking paw prints around the sheep's corpses and around the pen, as if the killer had carefully been walking around at first, meticulously choosing its prey before stepping inside and making its move. The sight was, of course, shocking and terrifying, but weirdly enough, not for me. I wasn't as shocked and scared as I'd expected myself to be. Instead, I felt more frustrated. Frustrated about someone or something having been roaming around in my woods, causing a disturbance. I had begun to see these woods as my second home. As much of a reckless idiot as I was, I decided to follow the tracks. I was curious to see who or what was roaming the forest at night. If I wouldn't have known better, I would have realized that I might have just been walking into the jaws of death soon enough. I kept following the huge tracks until the trees surrounding me made the environment hard to see. I changed my mind as I could no longer see much at this point, the trees blocking out pretty much every possible light entering my eyes. So I whipped out my flashlight and shone it around while I could still hear the sheep panicking in the distance, just maybe 55 meters behind me. I was suddenly on edge again when a new scent hit my nose, a scent which seemed to be a mix of wet dog and fresh blood. This would soon be accompanied by footsteps on the forest floor, calm steps, as if something was walking up to me to check me out. I directed my flashlight toward where the scent and sound was coming from, and what I saw first were eyes, gold-yellow eyes, about four feet above the ground. Now this already meant that whatever it was was bigger than a dog, bigger than a wolf even. I froze as the beast stepped closer, and at this moment I could make out its face and front view of its body. It was similar to a wolf, though in proportions slightly bigger and sturdier. 
Its fur was dark on its back and lighter on its belly. It even seemed to have a short, dark mane on its neck. The animal appeared to be staring at me cautiously, but it didn't seem to be aggressive yet. From the blood on its snout, I could tell that it must have been the beast that killed those sheep. And now, I was indeed scared. Any sudden moves or panic that I could not control could mean the death of me. It wasn't like I stood much of a chance against a beast this big. Still showing no aggression, the creature came closer until it stood about five meters away from me. Then, as I stood there watching in utter awe and silence, the creature stood up on two legs, like a bear, now towering over me at about seven feet in height. I felt the hairs on the back of my neck stand up, and I took a more sturdy, defensive stance. I had to constantly remind myself not to show fear. It leaned forward a little and sniffed the air to smell my scent. It then perked its ears up, seemingly more suspicious of me. All I knew was that the bigger you appear to certain creatures, the less likely you are to be attacked. But no matter what I did, this thing would be looking down on me. Still, I tried to make the best of the situation, trying not to look intrigued or scared. This, as if by some miracle, seemed to work. The wolf-like thing stepped backward slightly, breaking eye contact with me. I took a tiny step forward and tried to look defensive or territorial. As I appeared to have the upper hand now, I did something ballsy. I spoke to it, trying to sound fearsome and demanding. My woods. Get out. Again, I was genuinely surprised that this happened to work. The beast turned its head away from me and growled softly, what seemed to sound like a protest. It then went down on all fours and turned around to disappear into the darkness. Before it completely vanished from sight, it gave me one last awfully human-looking glance, its eyes reflecting the beam of my flashlight. As soon as I could no longer see, hear, or smell the wolf, I let out a sigh of relief, so loud that I was afraid the wolf would still hear me and that it would come back. Only then did I start shivering, my mind and body at once realizing I had just survived a life-or-death encounter with an animal beyond the normal, something that reminded me an awful lot of a werewolf. Cold shivers poured down my spine, and I grew a little nauseous when I was suddenly startled by a piercing but distant howl coming from behind me. It was both beautiful and haunting, reminding me of the howl from a game I used to play called The Hunter Classic. The sound chilled me to the bone, and all I wanted then was to get the heck out of those woods back to my home. After about 20 minutes of speed walking back to my bike and continuously looking around me and pausing, cautiously peering into the darkness at every sound I heard, I made it back to my bike. Quickly, I unlocked it and raced home. Back at home, the realization hit me again. I might as well have been as dead and torn up as one of those sheep. When I calmed down, the questions started coming in too. Why didn't it attack me? Why did it react like that when it sniffed me? What's also strange is I haven't heard anything in the news, even the local news, about the slaughtered sheep I discovered. It's as if it never happened, with perhaps even the shepherd completely denying that his flock lost two of its members to a supernatural predator. All I know is that I won't be telling anybody in my family or friend group about my experience. If it comes up in the news, I'm sure people will just think it's a wolf, just like it happened with all the other sheep killings in the Netherlands over the past two years. And I'll be quitting my nocturnal walks in the woods for sure.
because next time I encounter something like that, I may not be so lucky. Lights in Coconino National Forest from ATL Hoodrat. My husband and I moved into our camper van back in October, and our first stop was to visit family in West Texas, then move on to Arizona for a music festival. After the festival ended, we decided to hang around Tucson for a bit and see the gym and mineral show before heading north to Flagstaff, then to the Grand Canyon. While heading to the Grand Canyon, we found an awesome boondocking spot in the Coconino National Forest. It was on this small forest service road that only had two spots on it, and one was occupied by a man and his young son, who I assumed were spending the day in Sedona, about 45 minutes away, and retiring early to their RV. We snagged the last spot before crossing, which was awesome. It was perched up on this hill that had been leveled at the top. You could see all the mountain ranges surrounding you with the ranch fence next to us. The ranch was over the next mountain in the valley. There were wild cattle around, and the landscape was absolutely breathtaking. I spent most of my day just staring out at it. It's an extremely remote place as well, which we love, because we love stargazing and privacy. We go to bed early most evenings, around sunset, waking up around sunrise with a middle-of-the-night bathroom break. We woke up and walked outside for our bathroom break, and could not believe the stars. They looked wonderful. We went back to bed and agreed to stay another night, just to see the stars again, even better. The following day, we spent listening to music and rock hounding and taking in the landscape. I kept looking at this one particular ridge, telling my husband that a bright light was shining on it, almost like a strobe. He looked and it was gone. It wasn't something I thought of until I saw it a few times again, and then I became concerned. As a wilderness first responder, maybe there was a hiker out there who was stranded on the ridge trying to get our attention. But the areas that the light came from changed, much too often for someone to be traveling by foot or bike. Later that evening, after we made dinner, we sat outside watching the sunset and decided to go back in the van to hang out while it got dark out. Then it would be dark enough to really see all the stars and the Milky Way. It was around 10 p.m. or 11 p.m., we came out, and I immediately looked up. There was this light that was so bright white, and it seemed close. I asked if that was the North Star, and if so, how could it be so bright and close to us? My husband said he wasn't sure. We kept walking around our site, looking at the sky and the satellites. We went around the van, then back to our original spot and looked up. Immediately, we noticed the light was gone. But then we began to notice the light again. It was moving further away. It was a different color now, too. It was moving rapidly. It would jump around almost like a hummingbird, but changing color between yellow, red, and blue. I've seen a lot of different phenomena in my life, so I wasn't particularly worried or shocked, especially since we had just seen the Marfa lights, which looked similar, but with more flowing movements. That all changed in the next few moments, when the light began to change colors into monochromatic ranges of deep violet and violet blues with magenta. It was almost peaceful looking, soothing. It started moving closer to us, changing colors more often. Blues, violets, pinks, greens. It came down to the ground level on the other side of the large juniper. I lost my breath at that point. The juniper was only a short distance from us, and at this point we noticed that it was literally peeking at us from around the juniper, just as we had been peeking at it from around our van. It moved so much, like, I guess the way to describe it, it was like a curious child, and it seemed like the light would have been where the face was, and as tall as an average male. 
All of a sudden, I realized how close we were to seeing it, and I became afraid. Because I don't think I was ready to see it. It's like a big question that's about to be revealed, and are you sure you want to know the answer? You can't go back. The box would be open. I may have made a noise or jumped back when the fear set in, and this light thing did not like this. It got very low to the ground, almost cat-like, and was looking through the bushes. Immediately, it began to pulsate red, the color of aggression. It scared the heck out of me, to be honest. We ran back to the van, jumping in and locking the doors. Our van has this bubble wrap mylar insulation in the windows, which we put up in the winter months to keep in the warmth, so we couldn't see out of them. At that point, I didn't want to. I was horrified. I couldn't catch my breath. After we finally calmed down, we decided we needed to look. What person wouldn't? We got out to inspect. Where the light had been before now seemed empty. This was a relief, but it also made me wonder if I was making the whole thing up. Then I looked to my left, just beyond the fence to the ranch. I noticed several of the same type of lights moving back and forth in greens and blues. They were pretty far away, so I wasn't so worried, and I felt a bit more calm about the situation. They were far away enough. For some reason, I turned towards the ridge I had been looking at earlier that morning. I thought I saw something larger moving in the dark. Of course, I told myself that I was just crazy, to disregard it. And at that moment, a bright light came on. But it wasn't a light. It was a creature of some sort. Very similar to something you would imagine from movies that depict alien beings as robots, or wear robotic machines. This machine was large and clearly visible. It was shining a light into the valley where we had just seen the blue and green lights. It flashed a couple of times and then was gone. All the other lights were gone shortly after that, and did not come back that night. I wish we had thought to grab our phones, but the first one happened so rapidly that it didn't at all occur to us to record it. Though there was quite a bit of strangeness in the photos I had taken during the trip. The Whistler From Spider Milk my family moved out to Texas almost five years ago, and for most of that time, we've lived in a spacious suburban house that we now own. I live with my mom, younger sister, her dog, and my two cats. This all started the summer of 2016, when the mobile game Pokemon Go was reaching the height of its hype and popularity. Despite my extreme dislike of hot weather, I wanted to hop on that bandwagon, so I'd venture out into the neighborhood while using the app in search of virtual Pokemon to catch. While out one hot, humid afternoon, I ran into another kid who turned out to be playing the same game. We exchanged greetings and chatted for a while at the local park. I'll refer to him as Brandon. Brandon was down to earth, upbeat and sweet, he clearly wasn't afraid to gush about what games he liked to an otherwise total stranger, but I didn't mind. His attitude put me at ease. We eventually parted ways, but I met him several other times during the summer. It was a Saturday when things in the neighborhood began to get weird. In Texas, the cicadas or cicadas get really loud at certain times of the year, they sound like millions of dead leaves rattling in the breeze, droning on for hours on end. And it's a good thing that I tended to tune it out, or else it would have bothered me much more. Anyway, that weekend, I hadn't been out playing on the app for a few days. I was eager to meet back up with Brandon and the occasional other kid that I'd run into now and again. I was out walking for probably a little over an hour, before I finally found Brandon jumping down the three steps from what must have been his house. He saw me straight away, waved, 
and jogged over. We hung out and played the game for a while, but the sun was beginning to get low in the sky, so I was getting ready to tell him I had to head back home soon. Although I knew the neighborhood fairly well, my mother wouldn't be happy if I came back after dark, but I didn't get the chance to bring it up before both of us stopped in our tracks, facing the end of a road where it opened up into a small field, a private property. A shrill noise had just come from somewhere in the distance. Now, I'm not a superstitious person at all. I enjoy a good scary story now and then like everyone else, but I didn't actually fear anything magical or supernatural. I'm a logical person. Brandon, on the other hand, was clearly on edge. The sound had been short, but the way it had cut through the dull, distant noise of traffic, that was certainly strange. You good? I piped up after a minute, nudging the kid, and he nodded quickly. Psh, I'm fine. It just reminded me of what my baby brother used to say. His little brother was named Tim. I tilted my head. What did he used to say? Brandon shrugged, acting just a little too overly nonchalant about it. It's dumb, never mind. But of course, I continued to pester him until he finally hung his head, giving a dramatic sigh. <sighs> okay, okay. Well, Tim used to have bad dreams because of something he heard from the kids next door. They were just saying it to mess with them. After I didn't respond, staring at my friend in anticipation, he rolled his eyes. <sighs> my god, fine. Tim said they told him about these rules. Two of them, and they're only for this neighborhood. I snorted. What rules? Like, homeowners association? Keeping your lawns tidy? Brandon shook his head. No, more like, uh, well, creepy rules. And it's more for the tracks than the actual neighborhood. To clarify, the tracks are the old abandoned train tracks that run next to the neighborhood going right past the cul-de-sac we were currently standing in. I had walked it many times before, even crossing the bridge over the river below and exploring the surrounding dirt paths, which people frequented often to hang out and be stupid in. I had never feared that area, but that's just me. It was definitely horror movie material, don't get me wrong. A seemingly endless track in either direction, surrounded by tall trees and covered in rust, sometimes graffiti. There had even used to be a train there, sitting motionless, but that had been removed at some point. For what reason and by whom, I have no idea. Brandon explained the two creepy rules to me. Rule number one, never whistle after sundown. Rule number two, don't look behind you. I laughed when he said that, and so did he, though he seemed more nervous about it. Getting serious, I reassured him that no whistling monster could possibly be out there, and that people were always looking for some legend to be scared of, for something other to believe in. Brandon seemed to calm down at that, and I had to head home, since the sun was about to set. As I mentioned, I come to the tracks often to explore and to be in nature, so I headed there around noon one day, sometime in July. I was already overheated, but I was determined to find this one Pokemon I was looking to get. Like so many times before, I was met with the hum of cicadas as I gradually left the asphalt of the neighborhood for the bumpy terrain of the tracks. I walked for roughly half an hour, skipping the bridge in favor of heading down one of the dirt paths by the river's edge. I sat near the water for a while, switching between Pokemon Go and my social media apps as time passed by. I wasn't aware how close to sunset it was until I spotted the time on my phone. Getting to my feet, I took a drink of water from my metal canteen, trying to conserve a last sip for the walk back. That's when I got a notification on my phone. Brandon had sent me a gift on my Pokemon app. I didn't open it just yet. 
I was actually reminded of those rules he had talked about. And despite my skepticism, I was curious and definitely scatterbrained. I was curious enough to wonder what would happen if I broke those rules. You could probably guess I'd be the first to be ended in a horror film. So I text my mom to let her know I was heading back, but since I was further out than usual, I'd be back a little after dark. She wasn't happy about it, but she sternly reminded me to manage my time better next time, so at least I'd avoided a real scolding. Having bought myself some time, I pulled up Snapchat on my phone, hitting record. Hey Brandon, I said, I'm about to myth bust those kids' rules right now. I told the camera, and then proceeded to whistle a nursery rhyme. I think it was the itsy bitsy spider. I waited in silence. After not a single scary thing occurred, as expected, I turned the camera toward myself and sarcastically raised an eyebrow before ending the video. I sent it to Brandon and started walking back to the neighborhood. Weirdly enough, the noise of cicadas had died down significantly, but I figured I just hadn't noticed it until now, having been previously distracted. So I didn't think much of it. Besides, even if it had been sudden, the worst things out here were deer, coyotes, and maybe even the occasional hobo so I wasn't really worried. Then, something like a crack came from behind me. I turned and looked. Guess that was two rolls down now. But there was nothing that I could see behind me. I do remember shivering, though. Even the most level-headed people can't shake paranoia sometimes. So I picked up the pace. The nursery rhyme I'd whistled earlier stuck on a rather annoying loop in my head as I clutched my water canteen, in case some crazed individual tried to attack me. And then, just as I rounded a bend and saw the streetlights of my neighborhood, there was another noise, something dry and hollow, sounding like the howling of wind, except this wasn't wind. This was more like a long, strained echo, changing its tune subtly in the middle, almost like a whistle. At that point, I was scared, but I didn't take off running, fearing I'd attract the attention of whatever had made the sound. This place felt taboo, like it belonged to someone or something else. Suddenly, I was quite sure that I wasn't supposed to be here. My hands were starting to shake. My anxiety was ramping up until it felt like it coiled itself into my guts, ready to explode with adrenaline at the slightest snap of a twig. However, there was no snap to speak of. No more sounds, no more whistling howls. But I could see movement ahead of me in the tree line to my left, between me and the streetlights. Trees, bushes being pushed just slightly, just enough to be visible. I don't know why, but I crouched down on the train tracks. Sudden movements for me seemed like a bad idea, no matter how much my body was screaming at me to bolt. At first, the shape that stepped out of the bushes looked very much like a bear, a shaggy grayish-brown body it was certainly long enough, maybe larger, although I wasn't sure there were any bears in Texas as far as I knew. Of course, it wasn't a bear at all, because, as it turned out, moving in the way that an ape or a man might move, but on all fours, my gaze fell on a thing that was the furthest possible entity from a bear. It was hairless, for one thing. It had an emaciated, pale body, with some animal hide stretched across its back as if it were armor. Its head was covered by what appeared to be a deer's skull, but I could plainly see that a grisly, deformed face and bust were hiding right underneath. All bony and stretched out, milky white eyes a stark contrast to the shadow the skull cast and the only feature of its real face I could make out. The thing rose up, 
the grimy pelt of the skinned animal dragging in the dirt as it did, head twitching as it looked around. By some miracle, it didn't seem to see me at all. So I didn't move. I wanted very much to cry, to be anywhere but here. But I didn't move an inch. Not until the creature fell back onto all fours, skinny limbs splayed out like a spider's. It was then that it raised its head, and I could see its actual jaw moving as it opened its real mouth under the skull. It was awful, the sound that it made, especially up close. I knew it had been what it called out earlier, but up close I could hear the snarl underneath the otherwise soothing, eerie howl. This creature, it was a predator, and it had nearly found me, like a bat finding a moth by a sick, dangerous game of Marco Polo. Eventually, the thing crawled back into the brush, but I didn't dare move until I saw it scale a large tree and jump out of sight. I crouched the whole way until the streetlights and sprinted back home from there. Needless to say, I haven't been back there alone since. I never told Brandon about it, but as he didn't open my teasing message, I assume he got rid of the app I'd sent it on long ago, so that didn't matter much. Here's a tip, kids. Rules are there for a reason. Don't break them. And for God's sake, do not whistle after sundown. Bigfoot in Gaston, Oregon, from Ryan. It was around eight or so in the evening when I had my encounter. It happened a long time ago. I was eight years old and had recently gone into foster care. I remember this sighting as if it happened yesterday. I was over at a family friend's house for dinner. They live out in Gaston, Oregon, and have a hazelnut orchard. The trees in the orchard are about 10 to 15 feet tall. They had two boys that my brother and I were having a Nerf gun war with because of how big the grounds were. My brother and I were standing by the back end of the house. My brother noticed something down in the orchard. Ryan, he said, a bit freaked out. Look. I followed his gaze and saw what he was staring at. There was a tall figure walking in between the trees. It stood close to the top of them. That's just how colossal it was. I would guess it was about ten feet tall, maybe just a bit shorter. We stood there, but I began to panic. It's Bigfoot, I shouted to my brother, who was trying to keep his cool. Be quiet, he said. The Bigfoot paused for a moment before continuing on its way. It was probably going back up into the hills to hunt before returning to the valley the next day. It was a quick but creepy encounter of mine. I've been criticized over my sighting, but I've had people fully believe my story as well. So, if you're ever in Gaston, Oregon, be on the lookout for a Bigfoot. It Hunts Me, from Raul Brett 260. I'm 17 years old and live in Romania. I live with my grandparents because they're sick and need someone to take care of them. The story begins last year in October, the first day I moved out here. My grandmother helped me unpack my stuff and she began to tell me the rules of the house. She explained to me that I needed to feed the animals, to help her around the house, and things like that. But one of these rules caught my attention. She told me to never, under any circumstances, leave open the back porch at night. I thought it was strange, but I shrugged it off as just another inoffensive rule. Days went by, the farm life got to me, and I began to like it. One night, I finished up my chores around the house. I went out to smoke a cigarette. It was pitch black at the time. 
I went closer to the back porch because my grandparents didn't know that I smoked. A few minutes passed, and I was beginning to get cold. Out of nowhere, I began to smell sulfur and iron, like something was decaying nearby. The smell grew stronger and stronger. I knew something was wrong, but the curiosity got the best of me, and I wanted to see what was going on. All of a sudden, something crashed into the fence to my right. When I turned around, my blood ran cold. There, over the fence, I saw the silhouette of a head. But the two things that made me froze were that the head appeared to have horns, and that fence was seven feet tall. This thing was at least a foot and a half taller than that. The next thing I knew, I was running like a bat out of heck. When I made it back inside, I was pale as a ghost. When my grandmother saw me, she knew right away what had happened. She sat next to me and began to tell me that that thing has been haunting the farm for years. And that was the reason that she told me the rule about the porch. Because that thing would only enter if it was left open. She told me that that was the thing that was behind my grandfather's death. My grandfather was found dead at the edge of the farm, and everyone blamed the population of wolves around the area. Well, everyone except my grandmother. She told me that one night my grandfather was working around the house. He forgot the back porch and left the door open. Around 11 p.m. that night, Grandmother heard him scream. <sighs> the only thing that she saw was a tall and skinny figure running away, all the while dragging my grandfather by the head. She wanted to tell that to someone, but everyone thought that she was crazy, old or senile. But I've seen it now. I believe her. I've seen it since then, and every time I look at it, it shakes me to my very core. But in a different way, I think I'm getting used to it. Crack Snap Run from Lucky Runner This was no normal camping trip. I knew that as soon as we got to the site. Me and my two sisters decided to go on a camping trip in Manitoba, Canada. I'm the middle sister, and the most outgoing, but not foolishly so. When we got to the small campsite, we noticed how the only people there was a family who was already leaving. It was the beginning of the weekend. The family even told us that it wasn't a good idea to stay there, Apparently, a series of strange sounds and noises had scared them away. But they didn't really specify what it sounded like before driving away in their van. We were a bit put off by this, but stubbornly set up camp, determined to have a good time together. We went on a walk together down one of the trails, and I decided to climb a tree, much to my younger and elder sister's chagrin at being afraid of heights, and not following my silly idea of having fun in the forest. But while I was up there, I heard large noises far off down the path. My sisters heard this as well. The noise we presumed could be a bear or moose, or another dangerous animal. I'd climbed very high up in the tree when I was trying to show off, with them being nervous about the large rustling sounds and the grunts in the distance. They were calling for me to come down quickly. I told them to book it back to camp, as my descent was a little slow on account of me trying to be safe. I told them I'd wait for whatever animal was to pass. Then I would follow my way back to camp. I'd like to point out that it was nearly twilight. That's when the animals out here move around, going back to where they want to sleep, or the night creatures beginning to stir. They agreed after complaints from my older sister. You know the basic, you're an idiot, and you better not fall, before they steadily jogged away. I went down a little farther, then sat still, 
when the noise was almost near me. Through the tree leaves, I saw something that changed my perspective on life. A massive wolf that looked stretched and skeletal. It was on the path, sniffing. My head hurt with how hard it was pumping when that thing sniffed right up to the tree I was in. I didn't dare move. It looked around, then up. Bright yellow eyes stared at me. Then, the creature stood up on two legs, like a person. A scream was caught in my throat, and I tried to climb up higher, again, to get as much distance between me and that thing. I tore off branches and chucked them down at the base of the tree, hoping to drive it away. I heard a grunt, and it stepped back from the tree, then spoke in a voice so similar to my sister's, yet not. You're an idiot. You better not fall. The words were more drawn out than how my sister had said it, almost like it was trying to get the right pronunciation by speaking so slow. That redoubled my terror, and I chucked more and more of this tree down at the thing. It paced around the tree, staring at me. Then I thought it decided I wasn't worth the effort, and walked off into the dim forest. After a few minutes, I descended once again, and once I reached the bottom, I looked around before making a final jump to the mossy forest floor. As soon as I landed, I heard a crack from up a tree beside the one I was in. I looked up, and the thing was up there, looking down with a predatory gaze. I mouthed the word, how, because I had no idea how it could have gotten up there so silently, without me hearing. It snapped a branch and appeared to be preparing to jump, and my brain screamed to run. I was a long-distance runner in high school, winning a lot of races, and I'd go on nightly runs every week. But when I say record time, I will always think of this moment, as I bolted down the path, dodging trees and jumping rocks. I could hear the breath of the thing as it raced along beside me. <laughs> and I know it was a race for my life. After ten minutes, I broke from the trees into the campground, covered in tens of scratches from my panic in the trees and the desperate run through the woods. I saw my sisters laughing beside the tent, playing that game where you put your hand behind your back and you have to touch the other person. I beelined for them, screaming for them to jump into the car. They saw the blood running down my arms and legs, and when they saw their brave middle sister bleeding and running at them, screaming to get in the car, they did not hesitate. They were inside, yelling to know what happened. My older sister was in the front seat, the younger one waiting with the door open for me to jump in. But the questions died out when they saw what was following me. I've never seen such fear in their eyes. I jumped into the car and my older sister slammed on the gas. She peeled off down the dirt road trail, leaving all our camp equipment behind. It was getting dark now, and my sister weaved down the trail in our crappy silver car like a pro. Honestly, I was surprised how calm she was. We hit the main road, and she sped all the way to a gas station. She pulled into the parking lot, and they immediately grilled me, so I told them everything. We don't really keep stuff from each other. We've always been straight up honest, even when it was hurtful, sad, or in this case, terribly horrifying. It felt like they may not have believed me completely, concerning the part where it talked in my sister's voice. It clearly disturbed her when I told her about it. We were confused on if we should call someone like the police. What do you even do in this sort of situation? My younger sister was trying to stop the bleeding from the cuts on my arms and legs and my face. I had an especially bad cut on my eyebrow that only bled more after my adrenaline left me. 
We were still in the woods, even if we were at a gas station. The place was located off a minor backwoods highway, and we decided a $200 Walmart tent and some sleeping bags were not worth our lives to go back for. We luckily didn't put our bags with our cell phones and cameras and the expensive stuff into the tents yet, so those were fine. And we do like to make sure our clothes and things are safe and stay dry if it ever rains while camping. My older sister, being logical, decided to call the cops to make a report that there was a dangerous animal that drove us from the campsite. The authorities met us at the gas station after a couple of hours. We made our statements. We thought it was a bear. This is what we said so that we didn't appear crazy. The cops went back to collect our things for us, but they came back with nothing. Just a few pieces of shredded fabric. They closed off the campsite and the forest rangers were called in, but they never found a bear. It's been four years now, and we talk about it to our families. We still haven't gone back to that campsite. To whatever wolf-like creature thing that was out there, I never want to see you again, nor those menacingly yellow eyes. But you're not going to stop us from camping, even if we have to go somewhere else. The Night Watcher from James Y. This happened to me maybe 20 years back. I was just out of high school and was visiting my grandparents, who lived on a farm in southeastern Oklahoma, close to the Washita National Forest. The farm was always a peaceful place to visit. You could just sit on the porch, swing out front, and it seemed like all your troubles from home had melted away. Lots of cousins lived nearby, and they would always come over. We'd have huge country breakfasts, then some would break out their guitars and start singing. Truly felt like a magical place. Well, until the sun went down. Growing up, if I ever went outside at my grandparents' farm at night, I always got this creepy feeling. A feeling like something was watching me from the nearby woods. I would often have nightmares of something coming out of those woods to get me. Many nights sleeping in the living room on the height of bed, noises in the night would stir my imagination, as if something was walking around on the front porch. Little did I know that, one day, something would indeed come out of that forest and make its presence known. One late day in my late teens, early twenties, I was lying on the bed, listening to music in the back bedroom which we referred to as the back porch. A room was later added onto the house, which was big enough for two full-sized beds. It was then that I heard a scream or howl, something ungodly and otherworldly, coming from outside. It was unlike anything I'd ever heard before. I can't even describe how scary it sounded. It was loud, and it echoed through the hills. Whatever it was just kept screaming. It was close, possibly even in the backyard. I jumped up and ran into the living room. My mom and everyone else was busy chatting and making supper. To give you an idea of my mom, and pretty much everyone else for that matter, if you were to bust in and say you heard a strange noise outside, they would just say, hmm, and go back to what they were doing. If you said, I saw something strange in the sky, or I saw some weird creature in the forest, they'd say, hmm, and go back to what they were doing. So knowing this about my family, I rolled my eyes, and I decided to investigate for myself. I walked out the back door with nothing but a camera. Okay, okay, I was young and stupid, but I was on a mission, and I was convinced that whatever was making this sound, it was something that probably hasn't been seen very many times by man. I thought if I could get a glimpse of it, a picture of it, I could report it somewhere as a little bit of proof of strange creatures that lurk in the woods. 
Whatever it was, it was moving away from me. The screaming continued and I followed it through the backyard, through the nearby pasture, and then into the woods. Deeper and deeper I followed this thing into the woods, each moment becoming more and more perplexed as to what that thing could be. What an idiot, I thought. This thing could be a mountain lion, a panther, who the heck knows what. I could get mauled out here. But at least I could take a picture of whatever that was that was about to kill me, I guess. But was the thing running from me? Was it luring me deeper into the forest? And then I realized that the sun was going down. Great, I thought. It's going to get dark in a bit, and I'm stuck out in the middle of the woods with this... thing. So I turned around and headed for home, always hearing that screaming in the distance behind me. And by the time I made it back to the edge of the forest and made it into open pasture, it was pretty dark, and I didn't even have a flashlight to light my way. Luckily, I made it safely back to the house. Maybe a night or two later, I was staying a couple of nights with my cousin Billy, who lived just up the hill from my grandparents. I don't remember how this started, but Billy decided, and here comes me being stupid number two, that in the middle of the night, we would wake up, walk out the back door, down the hill, through the pasture, and go for a dip in one of my grandfather's ponds. Never mind that there were water moccasins and copperheads, but whatever. And for maybe three or four nights in a row, we did this. Wake up in the middle of the night, go to the back door, walk down the hill, walk through the pasture, go for a dip, then get out, walk back through the pasture up the hill again, then go back to sleep. On about the fifth night, Billy said, Don't wake me up tonight. Just let me sleep. You can go swimming if you want, but I don't want to go tonight. All right, I said. So that night, I just went alone, in the dark, down to the pond. Oh, lordy, it wasn't long before I got creeped out and just got out of the pond. I was making my way back across the open pasture, when I caught something out of the corner of my eye. There was someone else with me in that pasture. It was very dark, so I couldn't get a good look at it. But it was tall and thin, and it stood on two legs. I immediately froze in fear. What was it? There wouldn't be any reason for a person to be out in this pasture at this hour. Okay, well, anyone other than me... I figured this was it. Everyone's going to find my dead body out in this field in the morning. I don't want to go out like this. I managed to squat down onto my haunches, trying to get a better look at the thing. The moon was in the background, so I was hoping I could use it to shed more light on what this could possibly be. The thing just stood there. It didn't move, and I was too afraid to move myself. I managed to stand up again. I really couldn't see it very well. All I knew was that I had to get out of there. Finally, I found enough courage where I could slowly start moving away, beginning to head back to the road leading up the hill. After a ways, I quickened my pace, and I made it back up, steadily climbing, terrified that whatever this thing was, it would be following me and any minute it would grab me from behind, and it all would be over. I prayed under my breath, please don't let it get me, please. Back at my cousin's house, I ran inside and locked the door behind me. I got dressed and went back to bed. Billy was still asleep there, but I didn't sleep the rest of the night. The following day, I told Billy about what I'd seen the night before. We went down the hill to the pond and retraced my steps through the pasture. There were absolutely no trees and no posts of any kind within that pasture that I would have mistaked for a creature of some kind. It was literally an open field, with nothing much higher than a blade of grass. So what was it that I saw that night? Maybe a night or two later, 
I was back sleeping on the back porch at my grandparents' house. I was sleeping in the bed with windows above my head and to my right. My cousin Sarah slept in the other bed to my left. I was awakened in the middle of the night by something tapping or knocking on the window above my head. Instantly, the fear returned. There were no lights in the backyard. It was completely pitch black, so there would be no reason for anyone to be out there tapping on my window. I didn't see any light from a flashlight either. If it was a person, to what end would they be tapping on the window? And at this hour... Even more so, how did this thing know my exact location within the house? I could have been sleeping in any number of beds in the house, but no, there it was, tapping on the window above my head. The fear that I felt is uncontrollable. You can't move, you can't speak, you can't breathe. I prayed again that it would go away, but it continued to tap, and the fear rose even higher. I heard it walk on two legs around the side of the house, pacing as if wondering what to do. It came back to the same window and tapped again. My heart was about to beat out of my chest. If anyone could die of fear alone, I felt pretty close to it. I literally could not move to get help or scream out. I dared not look out the blinds. Then again... It may have been too dark to see anything. What seemed like an eternity passed before it finally left, but I stayed awake the entire night, too afraid to sleep. Only when I saw the sunlight creeping in was I able to close my eyes. I told everyone about it the next morning. No one really gave it much thought, though. My cousin Billy came down, and we went to the backyard by the window it had been knocking at. I wanted to see how tall it would have been to reach the window. I was freaked out, and no one really listened to me, except for my cousin Roger. He was 20 years older than me. He said that when he was a kid, Roger and another cousin of mine were sleeping on the back porch when they were awakened by something tapping on the window which freaked them out so bad that they still remembered it. This mirrored my story. What is this thing that's been around the property for at least the past 50 years now, and what does it want? I didn't spend too many more nights there on the farm. My grandparents soon were moved to a nursing home and passed away thereafter. And under strange circumstances, the house was demolished in a fire. I tried to share my story with the BFRO, or Bigfoot Field Researchers Organization, but they didn't publish my story or return my call or email. I guess they thought it was too unbelievable. But was it really a Bigfoot? It was far too thin compared to reports I've heard, and it didn't sound anything like the recordings I've heard. Was it some sort of creature like the rake? A wendigo, perhaps? I'm starting to think this could have been what I experienced. All I know is that these instances happened, and it scared the heck out of me. I don't care who does or doesn't believe me. I just know what I experienced. There's something in those woods, and maybe it didn't want us there. Or maybe it was just curious. But apparently, it's been there a long time. I believe somewhere deep within those woods in southeastern Oklahoma, it's still there. What I Saw in the Siberian Tundra From Russian Werewolf 756 I live in Moscow, Russia. Last summer in 2019, I got an invitation from my grandfather, who lived pretty much in the middle of nowhere in the Siberian Tundra. I was going to be spending a week with him in June. After all, I wasn't about to go in the winter to Siberia, as temperatures can plunge to minus 40 degrees. After my grandfather divorced my grandmother, who now lives in Moscow, with the rest of my family, he took it to his head to move to the Siberian wilderness, to a cabin he had owned even before he had met my grandma. There he could hunt alone, 
explore the woods in peace. At least, that's how he put it. After a ten-hour train ride to the village of Molta, I met my delighted grandfather as he awaited me. Even as a 59-year-old man, he was very healthy and enjoyable. On the ride to the cabin, we conversed as if we had been together forever. I was getting more and more excited at every moment. My grandfather discussed his plans. We would hunt two days that week, hike in the deep woods, fish in the nearby creeks. As we pulled down the gravel driveway, I sat there stunned. There was no civilization to be seen anywhere else, and there was just miles and miles of trees. His cabin sat in a grove of neatly lined trees. The site looked welcoming. As for the cabin itself, it was small, but cozy. It was built of red bricks, and there were about four windows lining it. There was a front porch with two rocking chairs, and I figured that me and my grandfather would watch the stars on some nights. The inside was very nice, with two cozy rooms, a spacious kitchen, and a nice living room with a TV. I unpacked and decided to step outside. My grandfather told me to wait a little bit, that he would have a meal of venison and vegetables on the table soon. I stayed up to about 12 o'clock. My grandpa had gone to bed at about 11, but I chose to watch some TV for a while. After watching a football game, what we call soccer here, of course, I was getting ready to hit the sack when I heard somewhere in the distance a loud and long howl. It was like someone was being torn limb from limb, howling out in pain. But my grandfather told me that we had wolves in the area. All in all, it was actually exciting to hear one. But still, I felt something was wrong. But I pushed it to the back of my mind. The following day, my grandfather took me hunting for bighorn sheep. We traveled along the hills. My grandfather warned me to stay as close to him as possible. There were wolves and other predators about. I inquired about Siberian tigers, but my grandfather told me there weren't as many in the area. They were bound to be more north. After a long day, grandfather managed to bring down a buck. Not what we were hoping for, but good enough. We didn't spot any of these bighorn sheep, which was strange as my grandfather put it. The next few days were filled with adventure, fishing in the creeks and drilling in salmon that would last us a good while. We trekked in the woods for most of the days, finally spotting bighorn sheep on a day that we didn't bring any hunting gear. On the second to last night, I was to spend in that cabin. That was when all heck broke loose. At about one in the morning, I woke up to the sound of howling. Darned wolves, I muttered, as I sat up in my bed. But as I listened, I realized there was something different about this sort of howl. It was deeper, like it came directly from the animal's gut. If this animal was a wolf, it had to be a big one. Wide awake now, I rubbed my eyes and cautiously stepped out of my room. I wondered if my grandfather was awake. To my surprise, I passed his room and saw him fast asleep. I tiptoed into his room and took out his Remington 700. That animal sounded close, but I thought I would open the door and just peek out, see if I could adjust the scope and maybe catch a glimpse of this animal, perhaps scare it away too. As I carefully opened the cabin door, the howl seemed to get louder. It sounded deafening. I was wondering how in the world my grandfather wasn't awake now. Silly me, I should have woke him up. But being naive and brave, I felt I could take this thing myself if it came down to it. As I fully stepped outside and carefully shut the door behind me, I saw that it was a full moon. The moon was very bright, illuminating the world in front of me. I noticed the area around was quiet. 
I then had a sudden urge to look to my left. I had this strong sensation something was watching me. There, to the left side of me, and merely poking out from behind a large birch tree, I saw a face. This face looked like a wolf's, but the problem was, it appeared a good eight feet off the ground. The moon illuminated its eyes, which were glowing yellow. The head of the creature was pure white, and it was impossible not to stare at it. I raised the gun, but I didn't need the scope. I had a clear view of the creature in front of me. Then it stepped out from the tree. It was solid white all over, a good seven or eight feet tall. Sure, it looked like a wolf, but wolves don't stand on two legs. These legs were very muscular, as were its arms. The thing had claws that could rip off your flesh easily. Then the creature opened its mouth and howled, the same howl I had heard the previous night. It was so deep and guttural, I was so terrified that I just fired at it, not knowing if I hit it or not. I simply ran and opened the cabin door and shoved it back closed after going inside. I locked it, and then I heard my grandfather's voice. What's the matter, grandson? He said, but in Russian, of course. He was very obviously worried as he saw the gun in my hands and my terrified expression. There, there's something outside. I leaned on the door trying to hear what was going on out there. Suddenly, I heard it. Scratching on the door, it was loud, and then we heard a loud growling coming from the opposite side of the door. It sounded so low, and I thought it was trying to talk. I was shaking, almost falling to the floor, and my grandfather's face was pale. He returned with an AR-15 not long after. What's it doing here? I heard him ask himself. Why? I looked over to him. What do you mean? I then realized that the scratching and growling had stopped. It was all quiet, and then a couple of seconds later, we heard the howl again, but it sounded distant. That thing, it has been here for as long as I can remember, my grandfather explained. It's eaten sheep and deer and left their mutilated bodies near my house and by the tree line in the woods. It never leaves me alone. Grandpa, I think we need to leave, I said. The two of us stayed awake for the rest of the night guarding the door, but when the first rays of sunlight streamed through the curtains, my grandfather told me to pack my things. He drove me to Malta, then stayed with me until the train that would take me to Moscow came. I tried to persuade him to come with me, but he insisted that the place was his home, and he had no intention to leave. When I arrived in Moscow, my family was surprised. Understandably so, I wasn't due to return for another day. I explained that Grandpa had some complications at the cabin, and it was for the best that I was sent home. I did tell them I enjoyed my trip, though, which was true until the last night. As for the end of this story... Well, I believe the creature to have been a Siberian werewolf, a monster that has been seen in the Siberian tundra, according to my research. And as for my grandfather, I have talked to him on and off, but every time I pick up the phone, he sounds, well, more sad, weaker every time we talk. I spoke with him a few days ago over the phone, but he barely spoke above a whisper, he told me everything was fine and that he was just feeling under the weather. I feel like this creature is getting the best of him, and I'm wondering if my dear grandpa 
will survive another month there. I need to do something, and fast. I feel scared for my grandpa's life, and I would do whatever it takes to make that thing leave my grandfather alone. My grandpa has so much to offer the world. Creature in Grand Portage, Minnesota, from Mel756. Let me start by telling you that Grand Portage is one of the most rural places in Minnesota, and it's at the northernmost tip of the state. The population is about 722, I think, at most, and it's on the shores of Lake Superior. It is indeed a very beautiful hamlet. We have hunting areas and great places to fish on the lake. In the winter, you can see the northern lights at times, which always keeps me and my family awake when we can see them. I live in a decently sized house at the edge of the woods and a couple of meters from the water. Every day, you can either take a hike in the beautiful woods or go to the lake, which is the family swimming pool, basically. As for me, I'm a 30-year-old mother with two children and a husband. We've lived in the area our entire lives. We've loved it forever and have no intention of moving. Even after the most terrifying moment of my life, it happened one fall day around November. I think it was November. I had decided to take a walk in the woods by myself. It was around 6 p.m. and the sky was beginning to darken. I didn't mind. I had walked in the woods hundreds of times at dusk or even the pitch black night. Nothing ever happened to me. I didn't realize that that night would change my opinion of these woods forever. I zipped up my coat and walked outside. I breathed in the fresh air and the crisp air made me feel at ease. My husband goes hunting and fishing in these woods from time to time and he had taught me all the paths in the woods. I took the path leading to the deep woods and I wasn't worried. As I said, I'd been taught these paths thoroughly so I knew them like the back of my hand. As I was walking, I saw the occasional rabbit and chubby squirrel, and I was lucky enough to catch a glimpse of a doe and her fawn under the darkening sky. As I walked further into the woods, I suddenly picked up that all the sounds in the woods had stopped. No insects chirping, no footsteps of the nighttime animals. I was confused, but when I would hunt with my husband, he told me that it was because a predator was near coyotes, wolves, and the occasional bear. There were also moose in these woods, and since these woods sort of connected with a Grand Portage State Park, I was sure there were hundreds of them. Suddenly, I heard an ear-piercing wail. I had never heard something like that in all the years of my life. No animal in these woods can make a sound like that, not even one of those screech owls. I picked up on the smell of decay right after that, like rotting flesh and decaying fish. I pressed my fingers over my nose and gagged. There must have been a very dead animal around here. I realized then that I heard soft footsteps coming my way, but for right now, they were to the left. I turned, but saw nothing. Gradually, the footsteps grew louder, and I turned to run but tripped on a piece of bark. I then heard something that I would never forget. My five-year-old son's voice was calling me from the right, just behind a couple of big oak trees. Mommy, mommy, is that you? Come here, I found something cool. I wrinkled my face in confusion. My son was obviously not out here. He was in bed at this time of night. Furthermore, he would not come out here alone. He would easily get lost or hurt in these woods. The voice repeated the same thing again, not changing in tone or speed. The voice was my son's, but it was all wrong, too. It seemed as if someone had recorded his voice and played it with static. I was panicking, and as I got up, the thing responsible for talking in my son's voice stepped out from behind one of the oak trees. 
It was about six feet tall, a bit taller than me. It was lanky, too. The thing's face was horrible. It had the deepest black eyes I'd ever seen, and I knew those two eyes were staring at me. It had no nose, but its mouth was huge. Its skin was pale gray with white. It had no hair on its head, and I could see ribs protruding from its sides. Its arms were super thin, as were its legs, but for some reason, it looked strong. Suddenly, it did what I could only describe as a smile. This smile chilled me so much that it felt as if 100 cold fronts were going over my body. The thing had jagged white teeth. Slowly, its mouth seemed to expand even wider, making its mouth almost too big for its face. Then, it did something that scared me ever more. It spoke in my seven-year-old daughter's voice, saying, Mommy, it's cold. Let's go home. I managed to let out a scream as I bolted down the path that led back to the house. I ran with everything I had, but I knew that thing was behind me because I heard raspy breathing along with rapid footsteps. It released a series of ear-piercing wails and shrieks, but I did not turn around. As I made it to the clearing, I heard the thing stop. I no longer heard footsteps, but that didn't slow me from bolting up the porch steps and opening the door. I slammed it closed and locked it behind me. My husband, surprised, asked me what was wrong. He was coming out of the kitchen with a bowl of oatmeal. He must have seen the fear on my face as I pulled down the shades of all the windows of the house. When I regained my composure, I managed to sit down and talk with him. To my surprise, he believed me, admitting that on some hunts he had heard shrieks coming from deeper in the woods. I did a lot of research and the closest thing I could come up with was either a wendigo or a rake or something. All I can tell you is this story is true, but whoever does or doesn't believe it, it doesn't matter to me. I know what I saw. I know what I heard. It wasn't a bear or anything of the like. I never go out at night anymore, and even in broad daylight, I carry one of my husband's hunting rifles just in case. Something in the Woods of New Jersey from DM5172222 I used to live in Chatsworth, New Jersey. There was a forest nearby, about a five-minute walk away from the house. It was three years ago when I was 18. I loved to go adventuring in it with friends, but once in a while, I would go in alone. This incident that would haunt me forever happened on a Saturday during the summer. On that occasion, I decided to go camping with my friends, whose names I'll just refer to as A and C. We hung out for a while at my house, playing video games and watching TV. I remember that A had this strange liking for peanut butter and oatmeal, so he went to the kitchen to make some, while C and I stuck to cold cuts and snacks. Eventually, after two hours of eating and playing video games, we started out towards the woods in my truck, joking and laughing. Entering the woods, we spotted a few snakes and deer. C even saw a rabbit. We eventually parked and started walking. After a full day of this, we were too tired to make our way back to the area that we were supposed to set up camp in so we decided to set up camp where we were. We all had our own tents, so I decided to set my tent in a small clearing right by a small creek. It was only a one-minute walk away from A and C, so I wasn't worried. Before we went to sleep, we sat around the campfire telling jokes and eating junk food. At one in the morning, we finally got tired enough to go to bed. I wish I could have kept that same good mood, but fate had other plans. I fell asleep at around 
and slept until I was awakened. I heard splashing and a twig snapping outside. It was still dark out. I was immediately creeped out. I thought it may have been a black bear. Bears in general can be dangerous. I slowly worked up the nerve to look outside, and I saw a goat. It was a goat drinking out of the creek, but there was something weird about it. The goat had black patches on its back that looked like skin. At first, I thought it was hurt or deformed or even mangy or something, but seeing how calm it acted, I wasn't so sure. Then, in a split moment, it looked directly at me and gave out this crazy yelp that sounded like a cross between a bat chittering and a goat bleating. Then, it unfolded these weird black patches and I realized they were wings, like bat wings, and it began to fly. I screamed like a baby and ran to where A and C were sleeping to wake them up. At first, they were annoyed, and A said, Poor baby, did you have a nightmare? But then they saw the look on my face, saw how serious I was, and sobered up. They both got up, and I yelled at them that we needed to get out of there, that I would explain later. So we ran back towards the edge of the woods where my truck was waiting. I was sobbing the entire time. C offered to drive, and I got in the back seat, screaming at him to step on the gas. A got in the passenger seat. I had calmed down a little by the time we got to my house. C and A demanded that I tell them what happened. And I told them. They both insisted that I was either dreaming or just crazy. But I know what I saw. The next morning, I got up, fired up my Mac, and did some research on what it could have been. And I'm pretty sure I saw the Jersey Devil. Just don't go adventuring in the Chatsworth woods. Creatures in the Brazilian Rainforest from SSS12345. I'm 24 years old. I took a trip to the Amazon rainforest in Brazil four years ago. I was going with a couple of friends, G and F. We had managed to score a trip there, thanks to F's parents who were loaded. We were ecstatic about the trip. It would just be us three guys. We thought we could manage ourselves if we had the help of some guides. We'd be traveling from our small Alabama town to Brazil. The flight overall, I think, was about 22 hours. We left in the afternoon, and we ended up getting there at 3 or 4 in the afternoon the next day, and we couldn't help but sleep much of the way. When we woke up, we were already descending. We could see the Rio de Janeiro airport below us, so I took a couple of pictures. By then, I was wide awake. G and F were coming too as well. We were desperately praying that the descent would be fast so we could get on the ground. And once we had landed, we collected our bags and soon found our taxi waiting for us. The guy in the car spoke no English, so we showed him the map we had. He knew where we were going. The car ride itself took another hour and our destination was some very remote village where our guide, Francisco, was waiting for us. Francisco was an interesting character, about 30 years old and had wavy brown hair with dark brown eyes. He seemed like the type that did not put up with any crap, and he wore the most serious expression on his face. The three of us shook his hand one at a time. Now Francisco spoke in broken English, but it wasn't so bad that we couldn't understand, but I'll make it clear here whenever he speaks. He gradually opened up to us and got used to us. He planned to take us deep into the rainforest, to some lagoons and the Amazon River itself. We were hoping to see some big snakes and other bizarre animals. We were in the village of Iguape, a neat little quiet place where all the people were warm and friendly. Francisco's family themselves welcomed us, giving us spacey rooms for the night. 
We had a delicious meal of beans and rice, along with some very delicious chicken, followed by some sweets that I don't really remember too well. The next morning, G shook me awake along with F, telling us to get our lazy rears up. F and I quickly got dressed, and minutes later, Francisco came in and told us to go. The car ride to the lagoon was 20 minutes, since Iguape was roughly full of rainforest itself. This lagoon was small, and by the time we stepped out of the car, the insects and birds greeted us. The humidity was great, and the three of us guys were getting rowdy with excitement, but Francisco calmed us down for a moment. He warned us to pay close attention to him, stating, We are spending two nights with a tribe called the Guarani. They are the friendly tribe, and I've already contacted them. I replied, Well, thank God they're friendly. But aren't there isolated, dangerous tribes here? Francisco answered me, Whatever you do, stay close to the village, if you decide to explore a bit. But you must stay close, and most importantly, when we're on the river, keep your head down low. Sometimes they may fire arrows at us, but don't worry, we're going to be fine. G and F laughed. Maybe we'll have shrunken heads by the end of the trip. Francisco's scowl deepened. There's nothing funny. My own friend went too far away from the village and was never seen again. I know it was no animal, because I took a small hunting party out there, and we found arrowheads and blood where he'd been going. I felt a chill. I saw that G's and F's faces had darkened, too. We exchanged glances. I realized this could be dangerous, but deep down, I was still excited and determined to show it. When we arrived at the Guarani's village, we were surprised at their looks. They had tattoos and nose rings. Some wore masks. The leader, whose name I think was Gulan, or something along those lines, awkwardly shook hands with us as he and Francisco conversed in their native language. We got to the boat, and pretty soon we were speeding down the Amazon. The scenery was amazing. We even saw a jaguar staring at us through some trees. We saw alligators swimming through the water. A couple of minutes later, Francisco pointed at the water, and we nearly dropped our cameras. A massive anaconda was gliding through the water. We were in shock. We had seen the top predators of the Amazon in under 20 minutes. This place really was as wild as you would imagine. This snake in particular must have been over 20 feet long, maybe 25, and it was easily 200 pounds. Slowly, it sank under the water. Then everything went downhill. Francisco began saying, It can't be possible. We've seen only the dangerous animals. We weren't really sure what he was talking about. It was the rainforest. There'd be plenty more animals to see, right? But Francisco seemed scared all of a sudden. Terrified, even. He began to try to turn the boat around, and F started fuming as the three of us weren't ready to leave. But Francisco suddenly jumped at him, putting his hand over F's mouth. Francisco hissed, Hush, boy. These are signals of the wild. There's something dangerous here. The way he said it made me believe him. G must have agreed with me. F calmed down, but was breathing heavily. He seemed mad still. Seeing Francisco act like this, I started wanting to head back myself. I wanted to have fun, and now it was the opposite of that. As I was thinking about this, I realized something that I hadn't before. The rainforest around us went quiet. G and F had already picked up on it. They were looking around. Francisco, for some reason, was breathing heavily. Suddenly... Right out of the rainforest, we heard the voice of the leader of the Guarani that we had just met. But that couldn't be possible. They had only had the one boat that we were borrowing, and we were definitely a good five miles away from the village now. The voice spoke, 
in English. Francisco, come here, where it is safe. It's dangerous in the water. Our names were spoken right after his. It couldn't have been the same man because their leader did not speak English when we met him. But I knew it was his voice, gruff and raspy like the leader had. Plus, he rolled his R's when he spoke. The voice seemed to boom around us, and Francisco desperately tried to turn the boat around. But it was stuck. We couldn't move from our place. I was nearly crying at this point. We were far from the village. We had no radios with us. And our phones had no signal out here. And worst of all, there could be tribes out here who could hurt or even kill us. Francisco, what's happening? F asked. Francisco barely whispered a reply. It's the Mapinguari. I stammered. Well, what is that? Something clearly didn't want us here, and it may be dangerous. Something like your Bigfoot, Francisco said, crouching lower in the boat. I knew about the Bigfoot legend. Who hasn't heard of it? But I'd never heard stories of them making human-like voices. Francisco whispered, explaining that the Mapinguari hated for people to be in their territory. That we were seen as outsiders, and it would kill us if it got a hold of us. Apparently, these Mapinguari could be up to ten feet tall and the natives here were known to pray to them. All of a sudden, there was a large splash in the water. All of us turned toward the sound. There, I saw the most disturbing thing I'd ever seen. Some sort of ugly, massive thing was wading through the water. It really was similar to how you'd imagine the American Bigfoot to be. But instead of two eyes, it had only one large, menacing one. There were also two large fangs coming from its mouth that seemed to be about four inches long. Its arms were massive, like if they grabbed a hold of you, they could tear you in half with ease. This big, horrifying thing was coming right for us. G was crying, and Daph was yelling at Francisco, who was frantically trying to make the boat turn to hurry. The creature was swimming towards the boat, screaming in an unnatural way. Nothing of this world could make a sound like that. When it got within ten feet of the boat, it sank under the water. I was certain I was going to die then. I cried and screamed myself. Then, with a stroke of luck... The boat roared to life, and we sped out of there. At the last second, we turned around and saw the creature screaming, emerging from below the water. Back at the village, Francisco barely talked. He contacted a taxi to get us out of there. Back at the Guarani village, everyone seemed scared and quiet. Francisco hit us in one of the rooms, and we stayed quiet. When the taxi arrived, Francisco practically shoved us in the car. We rode away, vowing never to come back. We stayed at Rio de Janeiro the rest of the trip, and by the time we made it back home, we were still shaken. We told our families that the trip was incredible. While that was true, it wasn't entirely a positive sort of incredible. That trip will haunt us for the rest of our lives. Whatever you do, if you plan on going to the rainforest in Brazil, be careful and know what may be out there. Skinwalker from the Desert From Sammy Lynn I was 16 years old living in Nevada. I am active in the rodeo. This happened in late winter. My brother and a close friend, who for the sake of the story I'll call T, got permission from the local reservation to use their arena to practice roping. 
We got there early in the morning, so we'd have all the time we needed. My brother's horse and T's are both very even-tempered and don't spook very easily. My mare, on the other hand, will panic at the slightest of things. She can be a handful most of the time, to be quite honest. Since the moment we got there, all the horses seemed to be on edge. But we shrugged it off and figured once they got to know their surroundings, they'd be fine. After spending the better part of the day throwing ropes and chasing cattle, we decided to go for a trail ride to explore the area. By then, the horses seemed to have calmed down quite a lot. Now, there's a river that runs close to the arena, so we decided to go explore down there and check out some animal tracks we had seen earlier. Once we got about 30 yards from the water, we could smell what could only be described as a rotting, dead animal. Then something in the tree line caught the attention of the horses. After that, of course... Mine flat out refused to go any further. Being tired from a long day and frustrated from the horse's lack of cooperation, we all decided to call it a day. By that time, it was too late to load our gear and horses and take them back, so we decided it was just best to leave them there for the night and stay at T's, as she lived closer than my brother and I. We got their stalls ready for the night, got them fed and watered and headed over to one of T's family's friends, who offered to cook us dinner. After some good food, good laughs, and a few games of pool, the weird encounter by the river was out of our minds. When 9pm rolled around, we all wanted to get some sleep, but I wanted to check on the horses one last time. When I mentioned this, T's family friend warned me it was a bad idea to go out there alone at night. Wanting to respect that, T offered to drive down with me. We piled into the truck and headed back to the arena. It was only half a mile down the road, but the roads were very icy, so we had to drive slower than what I would have liked. Before crossing the bridge that went over the river, this feeling of dread hit me like a ton of bricks. I looked out the window just to be met with these glowing yellow eyes. They're hard to describe, all I know was that there wasn't enough light hitting them to make them glow like that. I'm normally a very rational person, but something in my gut told me that this was wrong. That's when T turned to me and asked if I smelled that awful smell, which I hadn't even noticed until she brought it up. When I didn't respond, she looked at me, then followed my gaze to see the same yellow-eyed glare that I was fixated on. We were both in terror, not knowing what the thing was that was looking at us, because from where we sat, it had to have been at least eight feet tall. There are no animals in these parts that are that big. I finally came to my senses and hit the gas. Our truck started sliding, but we caught traction and made our way back to the arena. When we pulled up and the headlight hit the horses, the very first thing I noticed was that my mare hadn't even touched her food, and for her, that is out of the ordinary. She's a bit of a glutton, and normally eats more than her fair share. The other two hadn't eaten either, which again we found odd, but being scared and cold, we got back in the truck and drove back without incident. We got back to T's at about 11, and as soon as our heads hit the pillows, we were out like light bulbs. I woke up suddenly to my brother grabbing my arm and shaking me. I asked what was wrong. He put his finger over his mouth and pointed to the window. I heard a tapping on the glass and occasional scratching. I looked at the clock and it was 3 a.m. T and I hadn't told him about our encounter at the bridge, but it was late and I wasn't going to tell him now just to scare him even more. Trying to be rational, I told him to just ignore it and try to get some sleep. But I was convinced it was the thing from the reservation, and it had followed us back. I didn't sleep for the rest of the night, and as soon as the sun was up, I woke up T and my brother so we could go get our horses and get home. I didn't want my poor girl out there with that thing any longer. I told T about the tapping and scratching, 
so after coffee, we went to look by her window for tracks. Sure enough, there was what appeared to be deer hooves, but they didn't look like normal deer. The way the pattern of hooves were, it was like the deer was injured, but that still doesn't quite describe it. It only seemed like one pair and not two pairs. After that, I was even more worried about the horses. They were all fine, but the food and water were still untouched. We loaded up, and we were out of there as fast as we could. As we drove over the bridge one last time, I looked into the tree line just to see a massive buck staring back at me. This thing was huge, and it looked rotten and dead. I swear to God, I saw skin falling right off of its bones. His legs were bent in all weird directions. That wasn't even the worst part, though. The worst was its face, because they contained the same yellow eyes that we'd seen the night before. I swear this thing smiled at me or something as we drove away, revealing a sickening smile with yellow pointed teeth. I looked away for a moment, only to glance back again, and by then, the creature was gone. I guess it wanted to get one last scare from us. I still have so many questions from that night, but the only thing I know for sure is that I'm never going back there again. Well, that brings us to the end of today's episode, but don't you worry because more scary stories are on the way soon. Remember, if you have a scary experience of your own, and you'd like me to narrate it, share it with us at darkstories.org. Check the links below if you want to support the show. Like and share this video, too. Until next time, here are the credits to my amazing patrons who have donated or continue to donate. Remember, stay safe out there, and stay creepy, because this world is a strange one. Siskiyou Wendigo, from Wicked Wendigo. A bit of backstory first. Oregon is home to thousands of long-abandoned logging roads. Nearly 50% of the state is covered in forest, and roughly 80% is considered timberland by the Bureau of Land Management. I moved here when I was 16. My mother and stepfather divorced, so I decided to move into southern Oregon to live with my biological father. I grew up all over central and southern California, so the lush, dense landscape of southern Oregon was a new experience for me. It is unbelievably beautiful here. We lived in a small two-bedroom home in the middle of a 65-acre plot of land. The property bordered the Siskiyou National Forest, you had to drive a good 10 minutes on a narrow dirt road through dense forest to find our driveway. The owners were a lovely elderly couple who lived in the area all their lives. They lived in a large home at the beginning of the property. The elderly gentleman told us we were free to hunt and explore on his land as much as we desired. He simply requested that we not go on the blocked logging road that led up to the large mountain to our west. We happily agreed seeing no need to ever do such a thing. This is my experience. I'd been living with my dad for about two months at this point. I remember being out of school for the weekend, and I loved the weekends. I would explore the dense forest with my dad's nine-month-old German shepherd, Buck. I'd even camped overnight a couple of times with Buck. I decided I wanted to camp again that night, so I loaded up my pack with everything I'd need for the overnight trip. I asked my dad, who was nervous about me camping alone, and he reluctantly agreed, only requesting that I take the hunting rifle with me. Black bears and wolves are uncommon here, but I saw his reasoning and agreed. I said my goodbyes and headed out with Buck around 6 p.m. that night. I was still new to the area, so I never ventured too far, only camping in places I had previously scouted. 
I remembered a nice little clearing to the west, so I headed off in that direction. I arrived about 30 minutes later. The clearing was crescent-shaped. The middle of the clearing was roughly 30 feet wide, more than enough room for my one-man tent and a small fire pit. I set my pack down and began gathering large rocks and fallen brush for the fire pit. I had my tent set up and a small fire blazing about 30 minutes later. It was dark at this point. Buck and I were sitting against a fallen log, roasting hot dogs on a large three-pronged fork. Suddenly, I noticed Buck's ears perk up. He's up on all four legs and staring straight into the dark woods behind us. Buck was still a pup. He hadn't quite learned patience or the dangers of the woods yet. So when I heard rustling in the brush, and I saw Buck dash off after the sounds, I wasn't surprised. I stood up and called for him. He wasn't obeying my commands. I started to get worried. I knew I'd have to venture away from camp to find him. I threw my boots on, grabbed my flashlight, and strapped my rifle over my shoulder. I headed off in the direction Buck had gone. I was calling his name, followed by whistling. I then stopped to listen for any sounds for a moment, noises that might indicate his location. I heard nothing but the crickets and frogs, so I pushed on. I knew I had to find him. My dad would be devastated if something happened to his pup. I was about 50 yards from camp then, when I noticed deep tire marks in the ground. They made a small trail through the trees. I remember seeing this before. The trail started at the beginning of the property and led up to the abandoned logging road the old man told us about. I decided to follow this small truck trail, hoping Buck had gone that way. I walked for about 15 minutes when the dense woods started to thin out. The moonlight was shining brightly, and I could easily see without my flashlight. There was a small gate blocking a one-truck-length dirt road. The road ascended the side of a fairly tall mountain. I stood at the gate and called, Buck! Here, boy! I waited for about 10 seconds when I heard from the top of the road, Back here, boy. My blood ran cold. It was like a distorted version of my voice. The tone was almost mocking me. I slowly began to back away from the gate when I saw something at the top of the road. It was on all fours, and it slowly crawled out from the tree line bordering the road. It was incredibly tall maybe seven feet, its limbs slender and long. It stood with a hunched back and turned its small head towards me. Its eyes were large and yellow. I was frozen in place, my hands sweating and my body trembling. Suddenly, there was a rustling sound behind me. I turned to see my dad running towards me with Buck close behind. I looked back at the road to see a single large male deer standing where the creature had been, and it was just staring at us, those all too familiar yellow eyes glaring back at me. I asked my dad if he saw that. He looked up at the road and said, Yeah, that's a fine buck. Maybe we'll come back tomorrow and track him. He hadn't seen the creature. We walked back to my campsite. I decided not to tell him what happened. My dad is a no BS kind of guy and I knew he would not believe me. I asked how he had found me. He said that Buck made his way home and when he saw that I wasn't with the dog, he went out to look for me. We packed up my camp and headed back home after that. I never saw the thing again. I still live in Southern Oregon but I'm far away from what stalks the woods of the Siskiyou National Forest. The Girl in the Pink Leather Jacket From Who the Heck Do You Think I Am? I'm a guy who's old enough to know better and still young enough not to care. That's my motto anyway, or it was until what I'm about to tell you happened. Beyond drinking, I personally do not take any substances, 
but I don't judge or care if you do them. Whatever you do is your own business. But drinking, though, I'm a fish. I can hold my own against the best drinkers. All of this is relevant to the story. Even though I don't indulge in any mind-altering substances, I seem to hang out with quite a few people who do. So a friend of mine called me, informing me of a crazy weekend-long party in the woods coming up. When my friends throw a party, it's always something that feels like an end-of-the-world event. It was late in the fall in upstate New York. If you're unfamiliar with upstate New York, it is beautiful. Nothing except for woods in all directions, lots of great camping areas, it's a nature lover's paradise. I'm six foot three, and at the time I was a good 220 pounds. I got my truck ready, a Chevy 2500. I cleaned it up first and got it ready to sleep in. I like camping, but I hate sleeping on the ground. So I put two cot mattresses in the back with three pillows and two comforters. I filled my coolers up, one with food and the other with beer and liquor. I said see you later to my dad and hit the road, heading off to this party. By about 6 p.m., I showed up. I enjoy being fashionably late. You see, while I'm not afraid of hard work, I had no idea if I planned to stay the whole time, so I wasn't about to get there and set up all their stuff for them. The area in question was down a dirt road way off the beaten path. A small open area of trees led to an open area surrounded by trees. When I got there, I was taken back. There had to be over 20 vehicles parked there. There were also 10 portageons past the cars on the left, next to the wall of trees. As I looked to the right, I could see people sitting around an area preparing a fire. Past that was a projector set up to a makeshift white screen. I was immediately hit in the face by a stench and a delicious smell at the same time, which was from a certain dank plant being smoked and sausages. I turned my head to the right more and saw that there were two grills going, and they were cooking sausages and burgers. Sure enough, there was a guy cooking on both with a stogie in his mouth. I made a sour face and sighed. Oh well, here we go again, I thought, dealing with my mentally suppressed friends and their enjoyment of something I still don't understand. Anyway, I pulled my truck in close to where the fire was, not giving a crap about how some guy was trying to tell me where to park. I smiled as I slid out of my truck. Towering over him, I asked, You want a cold beer? I don't feel like walking back and forth, and I'm not about to carry my cooler any further than I have to. He laughed and shook my hand, introducing himself. At that point, I realized I didn't know many of these people. I handed him a beer, locked my truck, and went looking for my friend who had invited me here. I found him finishing up his creation of the projector screen. I asked him what he planned on showing. Music, my good man, music. Gotta get the ladies in the mood for a good time. He thought he was a ladies man, and I humor him on it. He starts whatever he calls music and lights up a smoke. He informs me that way more people are coming and it's going to be a heck of a weekend. I light up a smoke and inform him that I'm only here for the ladies. He looked out and smiled at where I parked. Good view from there, he said. Fishing with the right kind of bait, too. We both had a good laugh. Fast forward a few hours, and it's about 11 p.m. None of the girls had really piqued my interest. I'm picky and have a type for the future missus. I go back to my cooler and grab my Johnny Walker. Figured I might as well get myself toasty and pass out, then head home tomorrow. I turned back around to see a girl I hadn't seen before. She was talking with the other folks and joined a ring of people passing around a joint. I walked up to my friend, not even looking at him, and I asked, Dude, who's the girl in the pink leather jacket? After what felt like five minutes, I turned to look at him with the serious look I get when I see something I want. He wasn't even paying attention. I asked him again, and he turned to me, saying, What? So for the third time, I asked, Who's the girl in the pink leather jacket? He replied, I've no idea, my man. I told you a lot of people were coming. I gave him that look and he started laughing. I remembered he was staring at something and asked him what he was staring at. He said that he thought he saw something in the wood line, but it was probably the fire playing with the shadows. It was loud with the music going, 
and everyone was feeling good. I shook it off and walked up to the girl in the pink leather jacket. I introduced myself and asked her her name. She was gorgeous, long dirty blonde hair with icy blue eyes and fair skin. She was short too, fit most of my criteria, which was awesome. She turned to me and smiled. I could have melted right there. Then she said, Wouldn't you like to know? Attitude. Yeah, I was smitten. We started talking some more. She was a bit strange, though. She kept staring off into space while we talked. She kept pace in the conversation perfectly for someone who was on a mind-altering substance while staring off into space. She stopped abruptly and walked back over to the crowd of people I managed to pull her away from a few minutes ago. So I joined them all as well. After about another hour, the group shifted into three separate units. The girl was happy to sit on my tailgate with me in our group. She kept her 100-yard stare going, though. My friend pulled me aside and asked me about it. I told him I had no idea, so he told me that she wasn't the only weird one that showed up. Even with his mental state, he knew not to just point at someone as he nodded in the direction of a man. So I let him talk while I gave this man the once-over and made some monitoring of him. He was strange, looked homeless. He barely spoke, and he awkwardly fumbled about. His clothes were dirty, and his jacket was old and ragged. He had a vodka bottle in his right hand, and he would open the bottle and take a sip every so often. He kept saying something about having to go pee. It was about 2 a.m. at this point. My friend said something about everyone hitting the bathroom before he turned all the lights off, so the girls all went to the bathroom in a herd and fast, all except for the girl in the pink jacket. She stayed sitting on the tailgate with me, so I joined her, and I informed her that if she wanted, she could share the bed of my truck with me. She'd have her own bed and pillow and comforter. She smiled, pushing me onto my back and giving me a kiss I'll never forget. She had been smoking and drinking all night, Yet she tasted like a breath of fresh air, sweet and smooth. I was wide awake then. Some of the girls were making their way back to the tents. She said, Don't go anywhere. I'll be right back. She rolled off of me and the tailgate very fast. I was up quick and looked to make sure she was okay. She didn't even make a sound and was already walking toward the toilets. I had a great view of her walking away. As I smiled to myself, I saw the weird guy with the vodka bottle. He was headed toward the toilets, about 20 feet behind her. I'm a chivalrous man, a southern upbringing, so I then too rolled off the tailgate, nowhere near as graceful as she had been. I hit the ground and it hurt, but I got up quick to head over toward the toilets, where she went and that man had followed. My friend stopped me to make sure I was okay, I was trying to hurry him up because I didn't want anything to happen to her. So when I made sure he knew I was okay in his stupor, I started walking very fast toward the bathrooms. I had all kinds of bad mental images of what I would find when I got to the toilets. I was about 100 feet away from the bathrooms when everyone was shook to the core by a scream. It wasn't human. It sounded like a mixture between an animal's and a man's. The porta potties were in rows of five. The back row was closest to the trees and had been knocked over, and I saw blood everywhere. My gun was in my hand and my flashlight was in the other. The last stall to the left of the five was where the blood trail started. Leading to the woods, there was the vodka bottle completely whole. The smell of blood and a rotting smell was filling my nose then and the man's jacket was shredded in the trees with blood all over it. There was hair everywhere. I was sweating at this point, terrified. It all happened so fast. I saw the man's arm, covered in hair, and it was no longer attached to his body. I held back a gag reflex. As I did, a branch snapped. Instantaneously, the flashlight went toward the noise. I would make out what was left of the man's body. He was missing an arm, a hand, his lower half, and his head. That's not all. He had chunks ripped from what was left of him. Then, what I can only describe as a white furry hand had plunged itself through his sternum. It was covered in a thick black goo, almost like tar. I took all of this in quickly, 
and it hit me that the thing that did this was behind his body. The creature had one icy blue eye, which was puffy and watery, and one golden amber eye. The LED flashlight I had illuminated everything. It was like some sort of disgusting horror film, like some sort of bear tearing apart a robot if I was in a science fiction movie. The most important thing hit me just before the others were about 20 feet from me. This creature was wearing a pink leather jacket. I could make out the bottom right zipper, as it seemed to be holding the man's body to hide itself. Just as everyone was about five feet from me, it threw the man's body, sending me backwards into everyone. What happened next was chaos, screaming, vomiting, and running. The only person in their right mind was me, and even to me, none of this made sense. I was pushing people out of my way to get to my truck. I grabbed Tommy and carried him to my truck, throwing him in through the driver's side door. Then I climbed in, just as I heard the saddest sounding howl I'd ever heard. A mixture of sadness and longing came from the trees where that thing had disappeared into. My friend and I were on the highway headed back to his place when we finally said anything to each other. He thanked me for getting him, but I just shook my head. Neither of us slept that night, and no one talked about it. We went back in the morning to get my friend's car and all his stuff. There was nothing there to support that anything happened at all. No blood on the ground, no parts in the woods, no ripped clothing. And I have no idea what happened that night. I am no layman to cryptids. This was not some story designed to keep you from sleeping. It was me sharing something that happened to me with you. What was the girl in the pink leather jacket? And that weird man in the jacket, who had hair all over his arms and smelled like feces and unwashed disgustingness. When his torso was thrown at me, it was hairy too, and his blood was more of a thick black goo. There was also human-like red blood on the ground too, by the porta potties For sanity's sake, perhaps that man was a skinwalker. I'm okay with saying that out loud, sure, fine. But what about the girl in the pink leather jacket? Were they hunting each other? The more I've thought about that night, the more I realized she was staring at him, not off into space, the whole time. She waited until the other girls were coming back from the bathrooms before making her way to them. Women go to the bathroom in groups for safety and for girl talk, I think. It was all deliberate. What can do that to a skinwalker, though? I've read some pretty creepy stuff about them. I don't know what to say, except that if she was not there that night, someone might have died. Someone is hunting skinwalkers in northern New York. I still can't explain what happened at Girl Scout camp a decade ago. From Grace A. I'd like to start off by saying that I'm a skeptic, at least for the most part. I do think that cryptids and ghosts and other phenomena exist, but I also believe that the best way to undeniably prove they do truly exist is to eliminate any possible explanations for what mundane, everyday occurrences could be happening instead. Maybe that strange creature following behind you was simply a sick, mange-ridden bear or coyote. Maybe the noises coming from your basement are from the house's foundation settling, or from mice living in the vents. But maybe they aren't. Maybe that strange creature is a werewolf or chupacabra or a relative of Bigfoot. Maybe a spirit or demon is making those noises in your basement after all. The only way to find out for sure is by thoroughly investigating, researching, and collecting evidence. I'm an animal scientist and a biologist by trade, and I've had the importance of data collection drilled into me for years. I believe it applies to unexplained phenomena just as much as it does to physical, structured, scientific research. I have had two experiences in my life that I absolutely cannot explain by any means whatsoever. I've thought about them a lot throughout the years and constantly revisit them, researching possibilities for what could have happened, and I've never come up with any satisfactory explanations. Let's start from the beginning. I was born and grew up in Kansas City, Kansas. 
I lived about 15 or 20 minutes from the Missouri border, so a good chunk of my childhood was spent split between the two states. When I was a kid, I was involved in Girl Scouts, as were several friends of mine. I was and still am a lover of everything wilderness and camping related, so of course I went on every single camping trip offered by the Scouts. Fourth grade came around and my troop was making plans for an awesome camping trip in western Missouri, about an hour from where we lived. The camp, which I'll call Camp T, was situated in the middle of a forest and offered plenty of trails to walk on and explore. There was a huge wooden cabin to sleep in, too. The weekend we had reserved to go to Camp T finally arrived, and I could hardly sit still during the car ride. When we arrived at the camp, everyone rushed into the cabin to find the best places to put their sleeping bags and luggage so we could go outside and play. There were maybe 15 or so girls and five or six parents, including my own mom, on this trip. We argued and bickered as kids do about who got to sleep in what room and who got to sleep next to whom. So I started unpacking and making plans for the evening. We were going to play hide and seek and tag, have a bonfire, make trail mix with extra M&Ms and chocolate chips, stay up late talking about books, movies, boys, school, ghost stories, and whatever else 10-year-old girls like to talk about. At one point while we were playing tag, I needed to run to the cabin for a bathroom break and to grab my bottle of water from my bag. My best friend at the time, Kyra, came with me. We went into the cabin and did our business, and as we were getting ready to head back out, the door to the room we were in latched shut on its own. We knew for a fact we had been the only ones inside, and it's unlikely that it could have been caused by a draft. We were in an interior room and the cabin had been recently renovated. It was not at all drafty. Of course, Kyra and I joked about it being a ghost and the cabin being haunted and blah, blah, blah before running back outside. But I wonder now if there was more truth to that joke than I had anticipated. Everything went by pretty normally for the rest of the evening. We made hot dogs and s'mores for dinner had some trail mix as a late night snack and got ready for bed. Kyra and I were sleeping next to each other and were excited to tell spooky stories and obsess about Harry Potter and Yu-Gi-Oh and Pokemon. We eventually decided it was time for bed. Kyra fell asleep quickly and I was getting pretty tired myself. However, I had an intense feeling of fear and unease in the pit of my stomach. I chalked it up to me being scared from thinking about ghosts and the cabin being haunted. I finally fell asleep, and I had been resting peacefully for what seemed like a few hours, when suddenly I woke up in an intense pain, crying, barely holding back from a scream. My entire body felt as if it was burning. My head was spinning, my vision was blurred, and I had spiked a fever. I stumbled out of my room and found my mom. She and the other parents woke up, turning on the lights to see what was happening. It turns out that what was ailing me was a very severe and horrible case of hives. My entire body from my feet up to my face was covered in angry, red, swollen, and itchy splotches, and there was no relief to be found from scratching at them. I've since had multiple fractures and tonsillitis so bad that I had to have steroids injected just to reduce swelling, enough for me to swallow water, and even those occurrences were less painful than these hives. My mom, a former nurse, grabbed me, rushed me to the bathroom, placed me under a cold shower to help soothe the burning and itching. I stayed in that shower for at least half an hour, and my God, it was heavenly. While I was in there, my mom found some Benadryl to give me and some ointment to rub on the worst of my hives. I took the Benadryl and let my mom apply the ointment, and then I passed out from exhaustion as soon as I put my PJs back on and made it into my sleeping bag. 
By the next morning, my hives had faded to gentle pink welts, and the pain and itching had greatly subsided. By the time I got home later that day, they had all but vanished. My mom and I tried and tried to think of what could have caused the hives. I don't have any food allergies, though I do have very, very mild nasal allergies from pollen in the spring. But this was fall. It couldn't have been poison ivy. It's not like I was rolling around in random plants in the forest, or even playing anywhere other than the grass in front of the cabin. I don't have any skin allergies to any plants or fungi that could have existed at Camp T. I'd lived in that area my entire life, and I had never had any reactions like that before, or since, for that matter. Something else to note is that there were nearly 20 other people on that trip. Why had I been the only one affected? My mom, who has been interested in spirits, positive and negative energies, and psychic readings for several years now, thinks I'm sensitive to spirits and energies. I, being the argumentative skeptic that I am, attributed those feelings to me having anxiety and being on the autism spectrum. But honestly, I can't blame her for becoming involved in what may be considered by some to be heretical beliefs. She had been raised in an abusive household that used a falsified version of Christianity to justify physically and emotionally tormenting her and her siblings. If anything, I'm super proud of her for learning to love herself and finding her own beliefs and morals. Maybe the reason I was the only one who got sick on the trip really was because of a sensitivity to the supernatural. I can't say that I really believe that this is the case, but my mom seems to believe so and it makes about as much sense as any other explanation. After that unfortunate camping trip, I spent a couple of sleepovers at Kyra's house, brainstorming what might have caused my reaction, and what might be living or existing at Camp T. But we never came to any conclusions. It's been about 14 years since then, and that remains the only time I've ever had hives, despite going to the exact campground years later and living and working in very similar environments in the same part of the country. It was truly bizarre. Maybe there was more to that feeling of unease than I had originally thought. Fast forward four years to middle school. I'm in eighth grade and my Girl Scout troop had shrunk to only me and three other girls. Kyra and I were still best friends but she had quit scouts to focus on other interests. The three other girls were all lovely and kind though, and I got along great with them. It was fall again, and we were looking into doing a seasonal camping trip. Eventually, we settled on going back to Camp T, planning on doing some hiking, plant and wildlife identification, and working on completing our silver awards. We joked about how I'd gotten sick from the ghosts the last time we were at Camp T, but overall, we were excited for the trip. The weekend of the trip arrived, and we made the drive out to the campsite with one of our troop leaders acting as chauffeur. Everything looked exactly the same as I'd remembered. Beautiful sylvan surroundings, vibrant red and orange leaves on the trees, Fresh air, expansive natural areas to roam in and explore. Ghosts, hives, and uneasy feelings were in the very back of my mind and were the least of my worries, for a couple of hours at least. The other girls and I made some plans for the afternoon and evening. Two of them, Eva and Courtney, and I wanted to walk the trails in the area and look for animal tracks and cool plants to get some exercise in. The third girl... Jamie wasn't feeling up to hiking and stayed behind with our chauffeur at the cabin to prepare dinner and discuss what to make for breakfast the next day. Eva, Courtney, and I decided to walk the main trail, which amounted to about two miles round trip. It circled out from our cabin, across a hillside, past the camp owner's house, and through a densely forested part of the area. We were all huge nature geeks and thought we could handle anything the forest threw at us. Eva and I both wanted to be exotic animal vets at the time, 
and Courtney regularly went hunting with her father. We were all fairly experienced in camping and hiking. We headed off with a pep in our step and smiles on our faces, ready to pretend to be explorers and make some cool discoveries. If only we had known exactly what we would discover on that hike. We'd made it to about the halfway point of the trail when it suddenly got dead silent in the woods. If you know anything about camping, hiking, or wilderness survival, you know that this is never a good sign. We saw then a strange, indistinguishable lump on the path several yards in front of us. Curious, we got closer to check it out. I wish now that we would have stopped back then, turned back as soon as it grew silent. But we were curious 13 and 14 year olds. We thought we were invincible. We crept closer to the strange lump and began to see what it was. A sense of dread crept over me as I realized what exactly we had stumbled across. On the trail in front of us was a completely eviscerated deer carcass. The top of the head was lying in the middle of the path. The ears and snout were intact, but the eyes were gone. The bottom jaw and part of the neck had been ripped off, exposing the tongue, trachea, and esophagus. The spinal cord was hanging out of the back of the head, snapped clean in half, though the other half was nowhere to be seen. Off to the side of the path were some of the poor deer's organs. Intestines strung out for several feet, liver and stomach nearby. But that was it. No torso, no lungs or heart or legs or random bones. And perhaps most disturbingly, absolutely no blood. No footprints from what may have killed or eaten the deer. I've done countless animal dissections since then, and I've seen enough slaughterhouse corpses and procedures to make even the most staunch meat lover go vegetarian. But this, it remains one of the most graphic and disturbing things I've ever seen. And thinking of it still makes me nauseous to this day. What the hell? Courtney whispered under her breath, as we approached the deer. Eva was completely speechless, wide-eyed and frozen in fear. What the heck did this? I asked Courtney, assuming she knew the most about local predators from her hunting background. I don't know. It couldn't have been coyotes. They mostly hunt small animals, and they would never leave a deer out here in the open near humans like this. They're scavengers. They'd eat all of it. I pulled out my laughably small pocket knife. Do you think it could have been a mountain lion? I know they've been spotted a couple of times in Kansas and Missouri. I doubt it. There haven't been many sightings near this area, and an animal that big would have surely been spotted by one of the camp workers, and they would have closed the camp down. Courtney grabbed her pocket knife as well, and Eva, who didn't have her knife with her, put a hand on her metal water canteen so she could have at least something to attack with other than her hands if it came down to it. We were all silent for a moment. A feeling of dread built up in my stomach and I was instantly transported back to four years ago when I had that exact same feeling at this exact same camp. There aren't any large predators in western Missouri. We have coyotes, foxes, and bobcats, but nothing that would or could, do something like this to a large, fully grown deer. No bears, no wolves. Very rarely mountain lions, and as Courtney said, we would have been notified if there were a mountain lion in the area. They tend to be pretty noticeable around here, and are extensively monitored by wildlife officials. We all glanced at each other and came to a silent agreement to get the heck out of there. We took off running at full speed down the trail, when we got back to camp, we burst through the cabin doors, panting and speaking incoherently, startling Jamie and our chauffeur, who looked at us like we were crazy. Eva and I were holding back tears. We were both huge softies and had never seen a horror movie before, much less a poor, torn-up, dead animal. Courtney was wide-eyed and speechless and seemed to be on the verge of a panic attack. We explained what we saw to Jamie and our chauffeur, and they both became noticeably uncomfortable. 
We were so freaked out that we ended up staying inside, playing cards, working on written assignments for badge requirements, and talking about random nonsense to distract ourselves the rest of the evening. We all slept restlessly when we finally went to bed that night. I couldn't fall asleep for what seemed like hours because I was paranoid that someone or something was looking at us through the cabin windows. We packed up and left early the next morning. I spoke to the other girls in the car ride on the way home, and they had all felt a sense of being watched the night before too. Needless to say, that was the last time any of us ever went to Camp T. On the bright side, at least I didn't get hives this time. Unfortunately, our camp troop kind of fell apart after that. We just didn't have the motivation to continue anything camping related, or even general scout related. We all got our silver awards at the end of eighth grade year and then left Girl Scouts at the beginning of high school. I'm just thankful that none of us were harmed or horribly mentally scarred from the experience, which could have potentially turned out dangerous or even deadly. I'm 24 now and still keep in touch with Eva, Courtney, Jamie, and Kyra, and I'm happy to report that we're all doing great and haven't had any more run-ins with strange creatures, eviscerated animals, or ghosts. Jamie and Eva are both married and have become a teacher and a physical therapist, respectively. Kyra is an amazing artist and earns a living from her art commissions. Courtney is an extremely talented professional horse trainer, and I have since moved to Oregon, continuing my education to earn a PhD in wildlife biology so I can continue learning about and helping the wild animals and plants I love so much. And if you're curious, I'm studying the relationship between native amphibian health and agricultural practices in the Pacific Northwest for my thesis. Anyway, who knows? Maybe I'll encounter another strange, unexplainable occurrence in the woods. Maybe I'll meet Bigfoot. Or maybe I'll find some answers to what exactly happened at Camp T. But all in all, these two experiences are why I can't consider myself to be 100% a skeptic. I have absolutely no explanation for either of them. I've researched plants, animals, fungi, local legends, even mental conditions that could cause hives or such intense fear and paranoia, and I've never found any answers that make sense. At best, it's a fun ghost story to tell friends and acquaintances, and at worst, there is some unknown horrifying creature or spirit living in the forests of western Missouri, tearing apart animals, and terrorizing those who venture too far into the woods.